Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. The Durham Public Schools Board of Education monthly meeting is now in session. At this time, we wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us, those in person and online. The purpose of this meeting is to inform our parents, staff, and constituents about the work aligned with our mission to embrace, educate, and empower every student to innovate, to serve, and to lead. The interpreters for tonight are Martha Romo Iguiles and Consuela Norden. Thank you all again for taking the time to join us. The next item on our agenda is a moment of silence and we'll begin. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is celebrations. Mr. Sutter. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board, Dr. Mabinga. It is my pleasure to bring to you, if I can um, uh, mangle the grammar a little bit, a lot of of the years tonight. Um, over, the, over the year, we have been honored to uh, show our appreciation and commendation for various educators and employees of Durham Public Schools who have distinguished themselves as leaders uh, and, and representatives of the district. And tonight we are bringing you as many of them as were available because I wanted to have a moment where we could celebrate teachers and instructional assistants and bus drivers and everyone else who do so much for Durham Public Schools. Some of them, a couple of them have been here before. Some of them have already received their spark pins, but we wanted this to be a moment of solidarity and celebration. And for that reason, we, be, we begin with our of the years from the Durham Public Schools Department of Transportation. I would like to invite uh, Joe Harris and our drivers and monitors and mechanics who have distinguished themselves this year. Mr. Harris. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Mabenga, board members, distinguished guests. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity today to be able to bring to you the men and women that transport our students, that monitor, take care of our special needs students, and the mechanics that actually work on our school buses and our vehicles for Durham Public Schools. These employees have been extraordinary during the school year. They have done various things to help contribute to the well being of our students here at Durham Public Schools. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not gonna take a lot of time and I know we have to get going, but I shall bring forth to you from the Southeast Division, Trial of the Year, Mr. Larry Dixon. Driver of the Year from the Southwest Division, Ms. Felicia Roberts. Monitor of the Year from our Southwest Division, Ms. Ernestine Lane. Our driver of the year from the Northern Division, Mr. Jeffrey Smith. Our bus monitor of the year from the Northern Division, Ms. Michelle McDonald. Our mechanic for our fleet operations, Mr. Shelton McKeaton. And our monitor of the year from the Southeast Division, Mr. Troy Patterson Hopkins. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time. And these are the employees, bus monitors, bus driver, mechanics of the year for Durham Public Schools. So I would like to invite our transportation superstars to walk the red carpet. 
re uh, receive a handshake or a fist bump as is their want from our board members and superintendent. And if you could stay against the wall over there because we will take a group picture at the end of all of our of the years. Mr. Harris, thank you very much. Our next rep, our next honoree comes to us from Parkwood Elementary School, and she is the DPS Instructional Assistant of the Year. Ms. Erin Morrison thrives on data and community engagement with the understanding that both can make a di tremendous difference in the trajectory of the lives of children. Erin asserts that instructional assistants are a huge asset to all schools, and without them, most schools would not be able to function as seamlessly. We are welcoming faces that students see every day in their classrooms and in the hallways, and we nurture and support their growth. Ms. Morrison received her award and her spark pin at Parkwood, but she hasn't had the chance to see you yet. Ms. Morrison, congratulations. I am now pleased to present to you our media coordinator of the year from W.G. Pearson Elementary, Bhavana Ramachandran. Affectionately called Mrs. R, she persists in making sure that students get the information they need to be enlightened and educated. After all, everyone is a learner and learning is perpetual, she says. Mrs. R says, I believe that the school media centers are the backbone of an educational system in a democratic society. I am here to provide resources to teachers, students, and the learning community from an unbiased perspective. Now, I have, I have a spark pin for Mrs. R, but I also have the honor of bringing forward Lo DeWalt with a special quick presentation. Good evening. We honored Miss R uh, at WG Pearson, but we also wanted to make sure that she was able uh, to get her award in front of y'all. So I will present this to Miss R. Thank you. Our next of the year has been with you before, but we wanted to bring her back with the group. And that is Tamiko Piggy, Burton's School Social Worker of the Year for Durham Public Schools. She is passionate about helping children and families succeed and reach their fullest potential by working collaboratively with the community to lay a strong foundation for the students at Burton. And she brings her years in child welfare and as a behavioral health specialist and pediatric primary care to her school social work. Welcome back, thank you, and we're glad that you could be here with all of our other of the years. And finally tonight, it is my great honor to present to you the Durham Public Schools Teacher of the Year, Mr. William Hill from Little River K-8 School. Mr. Hill says that he loves forming relationships that create conditions conducive for learning. He also believes in returning the mentorship that he was afforded as a young teacher. The support he received helped shape him into the teacher he is today. He says, my goal as a teacher is to create an environment where my students feel seen and valued as individuals, so they feel engaged and empowered as learners. William Hill, the Durham Public Schools Teacher of the Year, 
and probably the regional teacher of the year too. Board members, before we move on to our Spark Awards tonight, I'd like to get a group, a group picture. I would like our of the years to come down to the red carpet and fill in. I would like our board members to stand from the dais. I think somebody's mother is calling. And Tony will take a, uh, take, Tony will take a wide angle picture of the entire group. Each one of these outstanding Durham Public Schools educators or staff members received a spark pin. The spark pin is our symbol of excellence in leadership, not just among um, employees, but among community members and students themselves. We have three spark pins that we are presenting tonight to Durham Public Schools employees. And the, for the first one, I am going to call on Mr. Matthew Palmer. wherever he may be. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sutter. Much to celebrate this evening. One of the things that we want to celebrate is excellence, going the extra mile, and a commitment to our students and our community. With us this evening is one of our more recent Durham Public Schools employee editions, who since the very first day has truly hit the ground running. Mr. Vitaly Radsky, who's with us as a school planner for Durham Public Schools, is an exemplification of many of the values that we talk about here in Durham. Mr. Radsky, since starting in January of this year, has led us through enrollment projections for this coming year, as well as our work over the next five and 10 years. He's geolocated every student in Durham County, but that's not all. Mr. Radsky is the kind of employee that you almost have to pull back on and say, hold on just a sec. He's come to every community engagement meeting this year. He shows up everywhere. He is beyond just a school planner, the assistant wrestling coach at Northern High School. He is beyond that, a doctoral candidate at UNC Chapel Hill in the School of Education Leadership and Policy. He is beyond that, a, a tutor advisor and student advocate at Student U. He is beyond that, helping Ukrainian students match with advanced and secondary learning opportunities in Europe and the United States. Vitaly has proven himself, not just as a data analyst, but as a true planner, a problem solver, looking to take information and inform knowledge and action. He is an essential part of our team and reflects much of what Durham stands for. Please join me in congratulating and celebrating Vitaly Radsky with the presentation of the spark pin.
For our next Spark Pen presentation, I would like to call on Chip Sutter, the Chief Communications Officer of Durham Public Schools. Our Spark Pens are for work above and beyond the call, um, for not only what we do in our job descriptions, but what we do to ensure that Durham Public Schools is everything we mean for it to be. For the first time in three years, we were able to celebrate our teachers of the year and our retirees at in-person receptions uh, this year. And you don't know what you forget until you have to do something again after three years. And I would like to invite Sheena Cooper, our Director of Marketing and Community Engagement, into the boardroom you had no idea this was happening. Um, her leadership in making the Teacher of the Year event go off without a hitch, her outstanding support of the retirement event, her dedication to making sure that our people are recognized and appreciated and taken care of um, is a great gift to Durham Public Schools beyond all of the work that she does telling our story um, and uh, engaging our community. So I would like to give my trusted number two in the Office of, of Community, uh, the Office of Public Affairs, sorry, a little choked up there, uh, a spark pen in recognition of the leadership that she has been showing at Durham Public Schools. And our final spark pin of the evening comes from me and from Deputy Superintendent Nakia Hardy. And I would like to invite Pablo Friedman into the room, please. Eventually. And while Pablo, while Pablo is on his way, let me share a little bit about uh, why Dr. Hardy and I wish to present him with this spark pen. Dr. Pablo is the director of the Multilingual Resource Center. He leads a team of dedicated individuals who are bound and determined that no matter what your home language is, you are a part of our community. That is his, that is his work. And then there's his additional work that he has been doing for us very much in this last year. Pablo has been a community engagement champion, not only for our Latinx community, but for all of our families in Durham Public Schools. He played a key role in supporting our efforts to ensure that our families are going to be served with transportation well and efficiently this uh, coming year. He helped make arrangements and connections with organizations that uh, Sheena and I sat at tables for to uh, share information about growing together and about transportation, about other matters. Pablo's job description is leading a multilingual resource center, but he is a resource unto himself for communities as a constant voice on behalf of the marginalized, the historically marginalized, the difficult to engage, the difficult to find online, all of those uh, people that we serve. So Pablo, we'd like you to take this spark pin as a recognition of your leadership in Durham Public Schools. It feels weird doing celebrations without a student and a laptop to give away. We'll get back to that next year. Thank you very much for your attention. That concludes our celebrations.
members here with us. Uh, one of them has been around for eight years, the, the other one for two years. Mr. Lee, it's been a pleasure working with you. You were the chairperson when I came on board. I'm really pleased for everything that we've been able to accomplish together. I love all my board. They've been very supportive. Uh, finishing up my fifth year. But I'll say this, today is about Mr. Lee and uh, Mr. Raven. Mr. Lee, if I can describe you, our working relationship, you've been able to stretch me to the point where I'm still here today. You are consistent and you are a fair person. Those are two words that I'll describe about you, consistent and fair. You'll be missed. You've been impacted this community in a very, very positive way. When I came around, we had a couple of schools that they were about to be taking over. And I've seen you even before I applied for the job, how vocal, how aggressive you were involved to make sure that our, our school are staying here. So you have challenged me to make sure that we're not keeping status quo, that we're moving our district forward. And you're always proud of Durham Public Schools. Thank you for all you've done. I can go on and on. I know our chairperson may say a few other things as well. Maybe your colleagues will be able to say things as well. With that, I'm going to ask our chairperson, Ms. Amstead, to come and present to you just a token of our appreciation for everything that you've done for our staff, as well as our 32,000 students. You'll be missed, and I know you'll be around. Mike, we are grateful for your leadership. You were the chair when I joined the board. And I wanna say that you created a space that I felt like I could be myself, bring my ideas to the board. And you also have led us with fierce passion in every decision that we needed to make. Whether it was fighting for schools to make sure they had local control, ensuring our students were able to get back to in-person learning, or whether you were challenging us to make sure we're not maintaining the status quo, you always kept our students at the center. And I'm going to miss you on our board, your perspectives and everything that you bring. We've got a plaque here that I'm gonna read out, presented to Mike Lee with gratitude on behalf of the children, families and educators of Durham for your leadership, compassion and steadfast advocacy for public education. I know that you may not be sitting on the dais with us, but you have an opportunity to reach out and still engage and advocate on behalf of Durham Public Schools. I know you'll continue to be a champion for our public school system and I appreciate you for that. So, Board members have also prepared a couple words to say. You wanna start on this end, Mr. Spears? Thank you, Ms. Umstead. <clears throat> Mr. Lee, uh, it's been an honor to serve with you. You and I came on at the same time and I've enjoyed our eight years of service together. Um, <clears throat> the three things I, I think I admire most about you is that you, the first is that you care and you demonstrate that in every meeting uh, as you speak and as you do your work. Uh, you care about not only your own family, but all the families at Dura Public Schools. Um, part of that is that, number two, I think you've led as a human. You've always talked to us about what it means for your family, what it means for your neighborhood, what it means for our schools, and I respect that very much. Um, and then finally, and, and difficultly, I think you've modeled for us um, how to engage with our community. Over the eight years, it has not all been ups, it has not all been downs, and uh, your engagement with our community has been a model for us. So thank you, and I know we'll keep in touch. Mr. Lee, Mike, you were here um, as serving as chair when I came on in 2020, one of the hardest times I think to ever be in service. Your leadership has brought us steadfastness, steadfastness and calm during this difficult time, helping me to get grounded. And your words of wisdom was also helping me to stay centered and know what that North Star was. And I appreciate those words that you've given me. Being in service with you, I have seen your passion, 
which is evident in how much you love our schools, the children and the staff. You have always been so thoughtful and informed and I do appreciate how you've been available to step back and see the big picture, but also to lean in and analyze the details in your thoughtfulness and every decision that was made and how you led this team. You have given eight years. That has truly been a sacrifice that I don't know that anyone could truly understand until they're in this seat and our children are better for it. Thank you. Mr. Lee, Mike Lee, Brother Lee, I've, I've known you as a, as a colleague, as a friend, as a, as a brother. Uh, there are very few people in this world that I have as much in common with as I do with you. We've you know, both been from military families, HBCUs, in the band. I mean, you, you've done it. You had three kids, so I decided to follow up with that as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I just have a great deal of respect for you. You know, you've, you've always been one of those people that I could always pick up the phone and just ask for, for you to lend some wisdom on me. And I've always kept my ears open. So I hope you continue that. I hope you continue on the track that you're on. I can't wait to see you graduate and become Dr. Lee. And I just look forward to following you and your family as you continue. So thank you for all that you've continued to do for Durham. Well, Mike, it has been an amazing eight years. Um, that picture from election night with you and Matt and Sindola was one of my favorites. I will always cherish it. I know when you came on this board, Omega used to sit here and I know she gave you boxes and boxes of her old files because you were taking on that role and you took it on with such love and respect and care that she started making you fried chicken, right? I mean, that's how um, you come into a space as a person with kindness, as a person with heart and care for this community. And that's always how you frame this work. Um, we've been through just the one pandemic, but the superintendent searches and, and you know, really complicated stuff that folks don't get to see in closed session, that you have always been wise, you have always been level, and you have always been caring about this community. You are an amazing leader. Leader Mike Lee will always be your handle on uh, social media. And um, I look forward to finding ways that you will continue to engage in this community. You're not going anywhere. You're just um, doing this work in different ways. But um, I appreciate the role you set as a father. I appreciate the, the care you have for all children in this community. And it and always comes through with your decisions. You will be missed. but. Um, I look forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. It's been two years. And um, I just have to say that this board, the things that we have done as a board, you've been a part, a big part of that as well. Um, I commend you in your service. All of us who are here have our why. And I've never questioned what your why is. You know, I think that, you know, each of us brings different skill sets, talents experiences, um, it, is, it is part of governance in terms of all coming together and using um, our best judgment and decisions. Um, I have really enjoyed getting to work with this board. Uh, we have done great things, I can list them, but uh, I have also just admired just the level of making decisions and knowing why you're making those decisions and not catering to anything else. You're here to do what you're gonna do um, that's something else that, you know, um, is worthy of, com of, of commending, but also um, just the ways you lift up your family. It is something that a lot of people don't get to see on this board. The faces behind us. We're here because people are looking for us and they're, they're supporting us. And I want to send just all the gratitude to your family, your wife and, and your children, um, just all the ways that we wouldn't be able to do this work without them. And so I just appreciate and have always, um, you know, just really enjoyed just the ways that you show up and you show up with your family, with all the people who allow you to do what you do. Um, and also, you know, just having that boldness to do what you do. It's, it's something that I, I can understand as somebody who has an, you know, advocacy in my heart all the way. So thank you so much.
I was not expecting everyone to say something. I was strong until that point. So <laughs> I blame you all if I um, struggle making it through this. So <laughs> today I've come to the end of my journey as a public servant for Durham Public Schools. I've been waiting for it to hit me, you know, walking in this building for the last time as a board member kind of did it, but actually standing up there, it really came to fruition. Uh, my heart is full. Uh, DPS has been a large part of my life for over the last eight years. There were times where I couldn't tell where DPS ended and Mike Lee started. I built so many relationships here and even lost one of my DPS cornerstones in Sylvia. There are people who I feel like they're family and I would literally speak to them almost every single day and sometimes just come up here to chat on my days off. Um, there's so many things we accomplished in the last eight years that the district uh, is almost unrecognizable from the time I started. We have a new logo and I just want everyone to remember what it means. We're the middle circle. It's not really a circle. It's just where are the lines end. And each one of those lines are a different length. When it first, the first version of that, of that logo was a circle. It was just a circle. All of the outside, it was called, they're called lollipops. They were all the same size. And I said, no, that looks like a charter school or a private school. We need this one because all of our kids are different distances from the, from the center. And we meet our kids where they are. That's what that says to me. So each time you see that logo, that spark pin, I want you guys to remember that as we reach our kids where they are, no matter where they are. Uh, we have an entirely new administration. All performance metrics have increased. We've developed deeper relationships with the county. We follow science. I can list everything, but I can't list everything, but I'm proud of what we did, what we're able to accomplish. And that's why my heart is settled with stepping away from the board. I can honestly say I'm leaving DPS better than when I found it, and I'm proud of what it became. To the continuing board members, it has been a pleasure to serve with each one of you. I don't know, we don't always see eye to eye, but we all want what's best for our children. Stay your course. Make decisions as a board, not individuals. Lean on each other, but most of all, know that you have six other people dealing with the same stresses. So talk to each other. You all bring unique experiences to the board. Use that um, as a benefit, not a detractor. You cannot be paralyzed of making hard decisions because you're blinded by a few vocal, a vocal few. The inconvenience of just a few voices cannot replace the progress of an entire district. You must take the engagement as input. But stay focused on the work for the other for over 32,000 students. You serve every moment of your existence as board members. Know who you are, uh, who know who you're hearing from. Seek the voices, and don't let the pr the privileged few, uh, the privilege of talking, um, the the privileged few that who are speaking, um, and make sure you find the ones who can't come to speak at the board meetings. To the new board members, and I'm sure you're watching, find your center. This is what Giovanni was saying. This is my advice. Find what you know is your truth, your understanding of right and wrong. Your definitions of right or wrong will be tested, and you will find yourself questioning uh, if what you thought was, uh, was actually right. Governing is hard. It's easy to sit back outside of the arena and criticize. But you step into the arena, you are now stepping into the arena, you now take responsibility of lives and the futures of Durham County. You will never be right and will be criticized by 50% of Durham no matter what decision you make. Activism is easy, governing is hard. You are now governing, you are now in the arena. Theodore Roosevelt spoke of the man in the arena, which is, an important, which is important for you all and the continuing board members to remember. 
the quote is this, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better, done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives violently, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error or short and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows the end, uh, the end, the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails by daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold, timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. To the administration, I cannot be more proud of the administration we were able to build here at DPS. Dr. Mabanga, um, Dr. Mabanga was my best decision on the board. Uh, we made as a board. The success we're having is a direct reflection of the cabinet he has built. I'm excited to see how DPS prospers in the future under his leadership and based on what you've done in the past, the future is bright. County commissioners, I thank you for your ability to increase funding for schools starting in 2016. When the new board of county commissioners were elected, we immediately saw improvements when we were able to fund the programs we had been requesting for years. I want you to remember something I've said from my first campaign election, my election campaign. A healthy and thriving community is a direct reflection of the performance of its public school system, not private schools, not charter schools. When the school system is succeeding and improving, the community is improving and growing, you can draw a straight line from the performance of any county or city to the performance of their public school system. Go back to 2016 when we started being funded closer to our ask, DPS started improving and look at Durham now. To District 1, thank you for trusting me as your representative for the last eight years. It has been one of the honors of my life to represent you in every decision I've made. To those who are in my circle who advised me, who I could call on to understand the impacts of all of my decisions, who called me to give me feedback, positive and negative, who trusted me with their children and families, I thank you. To my family. When I started on the board, Nicholas was seven. Peyton and Cameron were three. For the most part, you've only known me as board member and daddy. After June 30th, I'm just daddy again. You all were my why in running for the board. Although I had to learn that my decisions couldn't only be focused on you, each, uh, each of you taught me how to be a better board member because you'd helped me see the challenges all families face in our education system. I miss many of your games and school programs. I couldn't be there for some homework nights. And when we were searching for a superintendent, I wasn't there at all. I know you all would gladly allow me to continue my service on the board, but now it's time for me to be at home as just daddy. To my wife, Erin. You've had to hold things down as I pursued my ambitions to be a community leader. You were my loudest cheerleader and pushed me when I needed it. You sat and listened as I blew off steam for hours and you uh, sat quietly with me when those frustrations turned to tears. You always knew what to say. You always were there. And without your support, there's no way I could have been, chair I could have been chairman for four years and vice chair for two. I could not have been here nor seen the successes I have. People love to say behind every successful man, there's a strong woman, I disagree. You are next to me, you are with me. And although it is me here at my last meeting as a board of education member, this is your celebration too. There's no way for me to thank you for your service to Durham. You didn't ask for it, but you held it up like the queen you are. Thank you for your love and support, and thank you for all you have done in the past eight, last eight years. 
Thank you all for allowing me this time. Fred Revan, the third. You have served our board for two years. Very proud of your contribution. You're one of the few board members that's really graduated from Durham Public Schools. And I can say I'm really proud to see your engagement, your level of thinking. That's what we did really well as a DPS to prepare you for this role. It's been really short but your contribution has been really amazing because you have been able to serve during the pandemic. You guys have to make some tough decisions in the last two years. And you always bring a different angle, bringing your math and science background to be able to challenge us in a different way. Thank you for the relationship that we had and thank you for your contribution as well. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Raven. You joined our board in an unprecedented time by swearing in virtually and meeting virtually for a whole year as we navigated decisions that none of us really were prepared for. I appreciate the different perspective that you always brought. Our team is only as strong as each of us as individuals. And I think your unique strengths and talents and engagement was um, what helped us be able to navigate the last two years. Also appreciate your love for Durham. I know it's deep, it's family oriented, it's in your blood and in your bones. And so when you make decisions, you talk about not only how the history has got us to where we need to be, but what it's gonna be like for your children who are the future generations of Durham. So I appreciate you and your service. I know you have served Durham, before you, Durham Public Schools before you were a board member on the Budget Advisory Committee and on um, Durham DSNAC, sorry, Special Needs Advisory Committee. I hope you continue to serve. Like I said with Mike, you may not be on the dais with us, but we hope that you continue to engage with us. And I know you'll continue to be a champion for Durham Public Schools. So we also have a plaque for you. Come on down. And it reads similar, presented to Frederick Xavier Raven III, with gratitude on behalf of the children, families, and educators of Durham for your leadership, compassion, and steadfast advocacy for public school education, Durham Public Schools 2022. I'll give the board members a chance to speak, and then you're welcome to share some words. Start here. Mr. Raven, as Ms. Umstead indicated, um, You've had a long arc with Durham Public Schools, and I hope that this is only one point in that arc and that it, that it continues. Uh, thank you for your service, both before this time on the Budget Advisor Committee and other ways, um, your public comments before being a board member, your service during this time and for what is to come. I've appreciated very much your energy and enthusiasm for this work. I truly appreciated that. Um, and I know that this is um, a community um, experience and a giving back for you, uh, given your, your history in this community, uh, and also as a father, as you and your family traverse the school system now. Um, I wish you the best and look forward to your continued engagement and friendship. Thank you. Mr. Fred Raven, I'm gonna take my glasses off because they're fogging up. Um, I just have so much gratitude for you. Two years of really hard decisions, two years of us being humans on this board. Make, we're making no pretenses, we are human in all the ways. If we were in a classroom, you'd be the classmate 
that would make sure everybody has a piece of sandwich. You would share your sandwich. If their kid was being bullied, you'd be the one to be right there and say, don't lose the faith, even if it's a whisper. You are one of the best human beings. When people have not understood, which happens, people misunderstand us all the time. They question motives. They question our integrity. Heck, they even make mistakes about, you know, maybe details that they didn't get all correct. I have watched you navigate complexity. I have watched you navigate what it means to be uh, a person who has been, you know, questioned and questions, like so many things that have happened and you stay steadfast. Your groundedness is very evident and your kindness has also been evident. You're the first to congratulate people. You're the first to, you know, check on everybody, make sure folks are okay. I've, I've been a recipient of, of that. And so I am so grateful for your service. Thank you for being, as everything that has been shared about you, somebody who's dependable, bright, you know, in, in all the ways and, and, and not afraid to show what you know, because at this point, this is what we have to bring to the, to the table. We have to bring what we know. And that is our strength, you know, to, to be able to bring our, our skills um, and your skills, sir, are, 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 are pretty extensive. And I also wanna thank your family. And uh, congratulations on your beautiful baby. You know, we've, we've, we've been with you. You've shared the joy. You've sent postcards to our home with your baby picture, you know, your family's pictures. Um, just those details, you're, you know, it's, it's, there's so much in terms of the care that you have. And I really look forward to continuing to work with you. And um, as, as our, our chair said, you know, whether it's not at this particular table, you, you are the table, you know, like this table extends long. Um, it's not just us who are here, sitting here, but it's also, it extends into the community, stakeholders and, and, and people who have wisdom. And your wisdom is, your wisdom is very greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Great. It has been such a pleasure getting to know you. I truly have appreciated your thoughtfulness and the innovation that you brought to this district in this time, during this time for such a time as this. Your questions, insight, and sincere dynamic thinking has created a lasting impact for this board and it will never be the same. Being a Durhamite rooted in Durham and now raising children in Durham cannot be taken lightly or for granted in the way that you have served and the way that you thought about processes and the way that this district should move forward. I will say farewell for now, but I know that we will continue to work for the betterment for our youth to have a better quality of life. Thank you. Fred, sometimes it um, feels like up here that we should expand this table and have more folks at the table. Um, but two, I want to start with talking about is Mr. Unruh and Mr. Kaysen, who were both beloved members of this board as well. And I first got to know you when Mr. Unruh appointed you to the Budget Advisory Committee. And I think Emily Chavez was also on that group. That was hard, tedious work that folks didn't really want to do at the end of a long day, but you were willing to do it and lend your critical eye and your expertise to that really important work. And um, then Mr. Kaysen stepped away and those are mighty big shoes to fill in this community. Talk about rooted in Durham and you were amongst numerous applicants and you cho we chose you and you brought this board together as we continued to, to lead together through this pandemic. Um, you hit the ground running, you didn't miss a beat, and you just jumped right in to this really um, glorious but tedious work. And your heart for Durham is always evident in every decision that you make. Everyone that meets you just comes out with such admiration for your kindness, and your warmth. 
and I can't believe you you came to all those meetings in person with a newborn. You needed a paternity leave from board duties, but we didn't even give you one. I know you will continue to serve. I know you will continue to, to remind us of our children with special needs and the strengths that they bring and the ways that we need to, to nurture them. And, you know, deep appreciation to your wife and family for sharing you with us in all the ways that, that you have served and will continue to serve and lead in Durham. Thank you. Brother Raven. Um, when Mr. Kaysen stepped down, you were the first person that came to my mind. I remember I was in Baton Rouge. We had, a, it was a virtual meeting and I called you to verify what district you lived in. You were the first person. And I knew that the process that we were putting forward, the thorough process that you would shine through. I didn't have to, I didn't you know, advocate, anything like that, because I knew your passion, your love for Durham, and the fact that you ran for a school board previously would shine through. Um, your achievement shines through. Your values of Kappa Alpha Psi shine through. <laughs> I, had to, I had to say that, y'all. I had to say, Cap Alpha Psi to the day we die, but <clears throat> um, I'm so proud of what you brought to the board. You brought things that in my eight years, I hadn't seen. The analysis of maps, the analysis of the budget, the questions, the deep dives. Um, when we had our two by twos, a lot of times me and you were on the same two by two. And, you know, sometimes I would feel inadequate because of the questions you were asking. I, I just didn't have deep questions like that. I didn't know how you came to that. Um, but I learned so much from you in these last two years and, and how to approach issues and stepping forward, you know, in the, in the face of winds, uh, headwinds. So I appreciate everything that you've done on this board, the culture that you brought to this board and I do believe that's gonna shine through after, after tonight. So thank you so much, I really appreciate you. Oof. Well, I almost had to get that tissue for a second. Um, so first I'll start, um, Sam, I know you're watching. Um, so hold Emerson close to the camera, just have her wave at me. I, I know she's grinning. Um, thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Carter Parker Emerson. Hmm. Almost, almost. Uh, thank you to my mom. Uh, to my dad, no longer with us. My sister, she's the crybaby. Um, you know, I've, this is whew, top five, top five moments of my life. Um, I've gotten married and I've had three kids. So you all can figure out where, where, this, where this falls. Um, to be able to represent Durham, it is, it is an amazing privilege. Um, it's an honor to be able to feel like you've provided something positive, right? I think that everybody has a quest in life and you're not sure what that quest is until you at least get halfway through, right? Because we're all playing it by ear. And, and while you're playing it by ear, you're, you're doing the best you can. Sometimes you're, you're treading water. Sometimes you feel like you're drowning, but you're, you're still in your path. You're, you're still trying to get to that, to that other side of the boat. It, it was a great feeling to, to be appointed to this board, but it does not compare to this moment right here. Um, being able to be in this room, being able to be in this space, it is, it is something else. And as you all said, I, I hope, hopefully you all don't mind. I'll be an unofficial ambassador, whether you all like it or not. I'm gonna be an unofficial ambassador. Um, 
my daughter, she won't be graduating until 2040. So I'll be here for a while. Uh, so I have a few more graduations to see. And I, I mean, you know, I, I, I made my mom proud. Like that, that, that's one of the, the boxes that I get to check off the list. Like everybody has their goal, right? Um, my, my wife married me, so I know she was already proud of me. She, she had no choice, she chose me. Um, but, but to be able to do that and, and you know, I, I have multiple siblings, but my, my sister Jordan, Nikki, everybody calls her. She's the one that I'm closest with. She's the one that when we were young, she would be on one side of her door. I would be one side of my door. We, you're not, don't look at me. You know, but but through this process, she has been there every single day um, helping with kids. Because when you have two full-time parents that are that are working full-time, and then one also wants to do extracurricular activities, like who who does that? Who does that? And and she was there every step of the way. So this is a this is a thank you to to them, but also to you all, because I don't I don't think you all get the credit that you that you really deserve. Um, when when I, I when I think of this place and I, I think of this board, Matt, you are the sensei, right? And and I say sensei because he has been a, a in the classroom educator, right? In Japan, they truly give credit and appreciation to our teachers. And Matt, no matter what is going on, your perspective is one that I've almost never thought of. And and I can I can always guarantee that I'm gonna pick up something from that. So so I thank you for that, Miss Valladares. You have a you have a heart painted on you, right? It, it's evident. It's it's evident. I, and I've seen so much growth from you from the time that you started on the board. Your 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 heart is pouring out, and and I and I I've seen you I've seen you start to actually like put the parameters on that heart, and and become more fluid in, in how you're explaining what needs need to be met, and and that's become evident. Um, Javanya Lewis. You are a equity champion. Your goal is to make sure that everybody has what they deserve, right? To make sure that everybody has an opportunity to access and that, that is so vital. Ms. Ms. Bettina Umstead, you are the acrobat because you have managed to balance this board, right? You, no, no matter what is going on, you have managed to balance this board. I don't think any board like this exists in, in North Carolina now, mind you, we're in Durham. It's 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 blue, but even even within that, there's always going to be different perspectives, and, and you've done a masterful job of balancing that. Miss um, Byer, you are the chief advocate of Durham. If if there's anybody that I want having my back, it's going to be you because you're not going to stop until you get what needs to be gotten, and and everybody is appreciative of that. And Mr. Lee, I, I've already given you your kudos. I, I mean, I, I just achievement, right? Cap um, that, That's you know, we we had a goal. Um, I think that we stay focused on that goal, and you know, even even though we have so much in common, our our positions weren't always the same. But I think you and I both always understand that we have sometimes an unfair. Um, necessity to have to speak through our thoughts so people understand our, our perspective. And, and that's, that's just a reality of the world. You just can't be in a seat. Sometimes we feel as though we have to remind people that we are deserving to be in this seat. And, and we have to make that go that extra mile just to make sure things are clear. And Dr. Mubenga, you, you, are, you are amazing. Um, I think if you look at the strategic plan, if, if there's one thing that you could point at in DPS that has made a world of difference, it's to point at this because if something is important, you will track it, you will measure it. And, and that's, that's the rule for everything in life. It's important to you, you're gonna track it, you're gonna measure it. And that is how we're measuring our successes and our wins. And, and it's not all, you know, it's, we're not batting at 100 right now, but we're so close, right? I mean, we've brought up so many schools we have so much more access to resources than was not there before. Not definitely not when I was here. I mean, I'm jealous. I, I, and I mean that. I mean that. 
I am jealous of these CTE pathways that, that all of our students have access to, the ability to have a college degree even before they leave high school. That's amazing, but we just have to always, and I'll do this as the unofficial ambassador, to always make sure that we advocate for that and we remind people day in and day out about this. And, and you know, if you're not ready for a four-year university, let's get you in Durham Tech because that's also another benefit of coming from DPS is being able to access that free education. So thank you all again. And I believe that concludes our celebrations. Is that right, Mr. Sutter? Um, thank you all. I know that this was a little of an extended celebration time, but it's you know important to give our folks the kudos while they are here to get them. So from our bus drivers and bus monitors who we started out with, who without them, our district would not run, the ending with acknowledging our board members and the service that they have provided for us for many, many years. That's important to take the time to make sure we honor our people. So thank you all for joining us in that celebration. The next item on our agenda is the superintendent's update. Board members, last week was a phenomenal week for Durham Public Schools. From our four specialty high schools in May to last Monday and Tuesday in Cameron Indoor Stadium, approximately 1,800 seniors took their next step into adulthood with all their rights and privileges as graduate of Durham Public Schools. And they will, they will, and they will take with them more than sixty-six million dollars in scholarship offers. So that's a remarkable increase over the last two years. And the further education that the Durham Public School is reclaiming its place as a school district on the rise following the months of remote learning due to COVID nineteen. As we're looking at preliminary data and reviewing outcomes with our principals, I want you to know that we are definitely making progress in addressing the learning loss that came with the pandemic. We are overcoming harmful effects of isolation and giving our students the attention they need. We have been remediating, accelerating, and our students are responding. It will still take time for the impact of COVID-19 to fully heal for our students. But our teachers, our counselors, and support staff are among the best in North Carolina. And they are committed to our students, our child-centered approach to teaching and learning. I'm part of them and of our students. I want to address some of uh, the concerns that have been expressed to me by families following the tragedy in Texas. Parents want to know that their children are safe in our schools, and they often want to know details about our security practices, details that need to be kept confidential to protect our students and staff. We pray that our security measures will never be needed, but hope is not a strategy. And so we plan, prepare, and protect. Just this year, DPS earns more than $1.3 million in grants to prevent school violence, training caregivers, training staff in social and emotional learning, preventing bullying, and more, as well as improving school security. We have implemented access control technologies, secure vestibules, and door access controls. We also have effective partnership with the Office of Durham County Sheriff and Durham and the Durham Police Department with ongoing training and dialogue to ensure that our students are protected, supported, and respected. State law enforcement agencies also increased their patrols in support of our schools through the end of this academic year. 
we take our responsibility to our student, teachers, and staff very seriously. We know that everyone must step up to ensure our students remain safe. It's about training, investment in our facilities, and partnership with law enforcement. Most of all, it's about ensuring that our students and our community at large receive the support they need to prevent violence and build happy and healthy lives at home. That is key to our mission in Durham Public Schools. Finally, board members, I want to offer a clarifying statement about growing together proposal we are bringing tonight and about the future of dual language immersion in Durham Public School in response to questions that have been raised to us and to our board members. When initially communicating changes to the magnet programs in the Growing Together proposal, we oversimplify by describing the DLI schools of, of Lakewood and Bethesda as sunsetting programs, as if they were magnet programs. However, Lakewood and Bethesda are not magnet schools. The DLI programs at the schools are only open to students who reside in designated boundary of those schools. I consider the DLI programs at Lakewood and Bethesda to be school-based instructional programs designed and implemented for those particular school populations. The schools may determine to continue or discontinue their DLI programs based on the available school resources and needs. Currently, the DLI programs at DPS are only accessible to students who reside in the Lakewood, Bethesda, or Southwest attendance areas. By proposing to open five regional DLI application schools, we are expanding access to families across Durham County. We have requested DLI as an instructional program. I hope this has been able to clarify some of the misunderstanding we had about Bethesda and we had um, a lot of parents and advocates that came from that school to speak to our board. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's concluded my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Mavinga, for the superintendent's update. The next item on our agenda is the agenda review and approval. Move approval of the agenda as presented. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda. Item number 11A, DPS Community Safety and Wellness Task Force. We have the educator vacancy um, position and we do wanna get that filled. We have three applications to look at. It just came to us as a board two days ago, but I do wanna make you, sure you all have time to speak with those candidates before we actually conduct the vote. And I just ask that we um, look to move this to our next agenda item. So a motion to remove 11A from um, the agenda. I would accept that as a friendly amendment. Is that what's in order, Mr. Attorney? I, it's a, okay. I'll accept it. How's that? <laughs> I just wanted to. <laughs> I, yeah, I would amend. Ah, yeah, I would do that. Mm -hmm. Do that. So do we need yep. to, we need to vote on the motion to amend and then vote on the. We have a motion to amend on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. We move and properly second. Any other discussion? All those in favor for the motion to amend say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passing unanimously. And now we also have the original motion, the now amended motion to remove item 11A from our agenda and move it to the next meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously. So our agenda is approved. The next item we have is Board of Education monthly meeting minutes, uh, May 19, 2022. I move we approve the minutes from May 19, 2022. I'll second. Been moved and properly second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is general public comment. 
I'm going to do a quick review of the rules as we get started. First, please state your name. And if speaking for an organization, please state your name and the name of the organization. Second, speakers are asked to present their comments in a specified time. We'll allot for three minutes this evening. When the yellow light comes on on the um, podium, you will have one minute left to start winding up your remarks. When the red light comes on, it will beep, and that indicates that your time is up. Complaints about named staff, students, or parents should not be voiced in open session. However, we are very interested in hearing your concerns with regard to public education, safety of students, or to the operation of the school system. Finally, board members will listen carefully and consider the comments, but we do not engage in a discussion with speakers. Our first speaker is Melissa Perez, and Melissa will be followed by Kim Pope. Good evening. Good. Good evening, Madam Chair, Board, and Dr. Mabenga. My name is Melissa Perez. I'm the Cultural and Linguistic Development Specialist in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, and I am an ally. What I share with you tonight represents only myself. The last time I was before you, I spoke about the discrimination and bullying that I've witnessed students and staff who are members of the LGBTQIA community experience over the last 16 years, I've been employed by Durham Public Schools. I shared how as a teacher, I witnessed students being picked on and bullied to the extent of severe depression and even attempted suicide. I spoke about the importance of putting a board approved policy in place to protect DPS staff and students that are members of this community. I was very general in my statements, but tonight I'd like to share the story of a particular child, which is similar to many students in our DPS population. There was a boy who all throughout his childhood was bullied, harassed, and physically abused to the point that he was afraid to go to school. This is also a contributing factor to the loss of our students in DPS as they're taking out and attending private and charter schools. These discriminatory and abusive behaviors against this boy brought him to a point of se severe depression, suicidal ideation, self-harm, and even attempted suicide. Unfortunately, at home, life wasn't much better because he knew he couldn't come out to his parents because he was very fearful what would happen if they found out he was gay. Fortunately, this boy had one family member, a cousin who was 14 years older, who was the only person in his family that he felt safe with in which he could confide. His cousin supported him and was always there for him throughout these difficulties of his childhood. And when he was 17, enrolled in paramedic school full time, his mother found out he was gay and threw him out of the house. The boy left the house and began <clears throat> to cry, called the cousin, and the cousin began to support him and now he's 28 years old. That cousin was my cousin. That older cousin who supported him was me. This is my why, we all have a why. So I would like to ask you because your voice has much more weight than mine ever could in this community. I ask our board, will you use your voice to support our LGBTQ IA plus students and pass a policy to protect them so that they feel safe. Sometimes the school is the only safe place they have. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Pope is next. And after that, we'll have Meg Goodhand and Sunny Geraldo. The family. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, my name is Kim Donovan Pope. My sister is a public school teacher here in Durham who have personally taught some of your children over the years. I'm here to ask the board, along with Executive Director of Safety and Security, Tina Ingram, to please consider installing Rhino Wear door barriers from Campus Safety Solutions in all Durham County Public Schools. Between August 1st, 2021 and May 31st of this year, 431 planned school attacks were reported in North Carolina on the Say Something anonymous reporting system. 254 of those rose to the level of being classified as life safety tips because a person had the means to carry out the threat. Last year, both Winston-Salem and Wilmington had a shooting at school. Unfortunately, we can't say it won't happen to us anymore. We as parents want the last line of defense to be the best line of defense. That's a classroom door. 
We need more than locked door handles that can be breached. We want our children and teachers to be assured that they're safe when the classroom door closes, as I'm sure you are as well, or that you do as well. The company's located in Jacksonville and the product is manufactured in Nightdale. They've installed units in other school systems across the nation. Locally, they're in Gorman Christian Academy, all Iredell County Public Schools, East Wake Academy, and several others currently in process. I have no affiliation with this company other than what I've researched and conversations I've had with the corporate personnel. This system is an ADA compliant, military grade, active threat lockdown solution. They're installed at Fort Knox. The Navy was so impressed after seeing a break test that they recommended they be in every Naval facility in the world. It's the only lockdown system that's fire marshal approved for single motion egress. It can be operated by an adult or a child in one second to gain safe haven in a moment's notice. It can be unlocked from the outside using a custom key assigned to school administration. Using a Wi-Fi signal installed at the bottom of the device, it has the ability to be connected to existing security system software. It can resist any effort to breach the door short of breaking the surrounding structure, therefore buying valuable time for law enforcement to help. Using this lockdown system will make the classroom a safe haven where students and teachers can relax and be more assured of their safety and security. In closing, I ask you again, please look into the RhinoWare lockdown system as it provides the level of protection our children, your children, and all teachers deserve. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Dr. Meg Goodhill. Ooh, and I am way down here, so it needs to come down. <coughs> Um, Dr. Meg Goodhand, my pronouns are she and her, and it's so great to see all the familiar faces. Um, I want to start with a quote for Pride Month. Hope will never be silent. That was a past leader in the LGBTQ plus community, Harvey Milk. And so I am so appreciative tonight that you're letting me use my words and not be silent. But I'm also filled with love in my heart for all of you and Dr. Mabinga in that you made a proclamation to celebrate Pride Month and to in encourage all schools to have inclusive lessons that represent all of our community for staff, family, and children. I, as many of you know, have been in Durham Public Schools for well over 30 years as an educator and a leader. And that just really heartened me so much. The other thing is I know that you all are not just allies. I know you're transforming transformative leaders. And I know that because you are encouraging all students to in the schools to implement to also excuse me all to be embraced and feel included and safe so they, they can grow to innovate, serve and lead the Durham Public Schools state admission. Both my children with two moms and myself have experienced marginalization in many institutions and situations. So this personally does touch me, but even more as a researcher, I know the unwritten curricula of our schools really perpetuates heteronormativity and homophobia, which unfortunately silences and marginalizes our children, our families and staff, and has the very many negative effects you heard from our first speaker, Melissa. <clears throat> Also, I know the research is that children at the age of three and four begin to identify their gender. Researchers emphasize we need to put in very strategic practices and it starts with strong policies, which you all have the power to do. Policies that include, that ask for inclusive curriculum and professional development for all of our staff so they have the tools to confront heteronormativity and homophobia. Teachers, I know, teachers work endlessly. You know how hard they want to do the best for their children, but they cannot do it without the tools, the knowledge, and the biggest thing is support from their leaders without having that fear in their heart because the fear is constant and it's real and they need that support. And on top of that, woo, <laughs> 
I do love Durham Public Schools and it would sadden me to think that any of our families are leaving because they're feeling marginalized and silent. Hope is never silent and I do not believe you'll be silent. I know you will go forward to adopt this cause. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you, Dr. Goodhand. Next is Sonny Geraldo and last but not least, Abby Bender. Good evening, my name is Sunny Araldo, and I am the DPS IA president, or whatever you may call me. Um, I'm at Southwest, and um, what started off as just getting an increase, a livable wage for instructional assistance, has developed more into now all classified staff. Um, we have met with several of you, and we've even showed you where um, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Target making the same amount of money as our classified staff are making. Right now, I'm working three jobs just so we can make ends meet. You um, they took away us working summer school for the first session. And I depended on the money to, for their summer. Right now, I took off to come speak to you again tonight. It's, I'm here every night, every time you're meeting to voice our opinions. We understand that teachers are the ones that are teaching our students. But if you don't have the cafeteria workers, the bus drivers, instructional assistants after school, there's, you know, what are teachers gonna do? Start pulling double duty on everything. So I know the budget's already been passed. You've already got the money and everything like that, but we need to figure out a way to keep our classified staff here and not going to other places. Um, it's very frustrating to know that I am making, working at a daycare, more money than what I make here. I make almost a dollar and a half more. That's one part-time job. My other one, I make uh, probably about a dollar less. And it's very sad that I'm having to do work and go to school that the district I am so grateful was paying for me to go to school to get my degree in teaching but we're having to work so much time that we take away from our families. So we need to figure out a way to come up with money to pay for classified staff, because if not, we're gonna be losing staff. When you send an email to a listserv, it tells you it's going to this many people. We started off with about 488 instructional assistants. I sent an email out, we're down to 437. That may not seem like a lot compared to other things, but it is when we are carpool duty, lunch duty, subs, we're everything when there's nobody else in the school. So we're asking for um, a raise, a cost of living raise more than the 2.5 because that's only a take of gas the way gas prices are. And we have people driving 50 miles just to come to work at DPS. So we are asking that the board try to figure out a way to get us up to what, um, about 17 an hour, which is what the bus drivers are making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Abby Bender. And then next will be Catherine Constance. Hello, my name is Abby Bender. I use she, her pronouns. Thanks for having me back. I'm here today to discuss the need for a gender policy at Durham Public Schools. Durham currently has a guideline, one I believe is in place since, in some form since about 2016. I understand that the district feels this recently updated guideline should be sufficient to protect and support LGBTQI children at DPS. There are many reasons why it isn't enough. <clears throat> Number one, the guideline is not enforceable and it does not ensure uniformity. It allows each individual principal to lead the school the way that they feel comfortable. Thus, they are not required to have gender support plans for gender diverse and trans children. They are not required to allow their teachers to discuss these issues in a developmentally appropriate way in the classroom. They are not required to make accommodations for a transgender child to use the correct bathroom that corresponds to their gender. Bus drivers, gym teachers, they're not prevented from separating students into boy-girl groups. Kids will get hurt and then DPS will be reacting instead of preventing harm. Without a policy, you will continue to have LGBTQI families leaving DPS if their kids cannot get into the schools that have principals who are allies. The guideline does not include any mention of increasing representation of LGBTQI families or gender diverse children in the curriculum. 
Currently, DPS is normalizing hetero families and cisgender children with the curriculum by only having these groups represented in books that are read to students or represented in something as simple as a math problem or a history lesson. DPS is saying this is the only normal and okay way to exist as a person or a family. There's plenty of evidence that representation matters for the mental health of our children. Kids growing up not seeing people like themselves in both normal life and people they look up to and respect leads to an othering. Othering results in exclusion, bullying, discrimination, and for this particular group of kids, the highest rate of depression and suicide amongst any distinct group of children. The guideline does not outline or require effective training. While training has occurred at DPS this year, it has been brief, not led by LGBTQI organizations that are experts in the field or even LGBTQI people. It has not been widespread. Training should include formal bias evaluation of all staff along with general education of LGBTQI issues. There are many more reasons that this is so important. Please remember that this group is protected under Title IX, but currently many DPS parents do not feel that their transgender, gender expansive, and LGBTI children are safe or protected. We've had a guideline. We need a policy to ensure this happens. I did look over the slides that were to be presented tonight by Ms. Giovanni, and I, I didn't see any of these things addressed. So I would like to ask that some of these things are addressed, especially on the elementary school level. Um, I did not see any mention of how these kids would be protected with the current guideline that exists. And in, in my life and with my child, I have not seen how the guideline has protected them. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Catherine, I believe it's Rebecca Austin. Olson. Olson. No, no, sorry, you will go first, Ms. Catherine. And then Ms. Olson. Good evening, Mr. Chairperson and Board of Education. My name is Catherine Constantino, and I'm a working mother of a rising fourth grader who has consistently attended DPS after care at Southwest Elementary and loved it. He is beginning July 18th at Pearson <coughs> Town in a few weeks and has been one of several children who have been waitlisted uh, for aftercare. We learned this just one week ago. My husband works. I have a four-year-old. I am a taxpayer, a public servant, and a product of public education, and I support public education. I have been told there is a lack of staff that is the cause of this massive wait listing. I have seen advertising in the last 48 hours for employment on social media. The responses alone on social media pages is staggering when you learn that the wait list was created within minutes of the day and moment of an opening of an application. Money has been paid. We have been waitlisted, and I do not understand how a public school system the size of Durham County can leave its working parents in a lurch. Your families are already struggling with inflation and gas prices, and now we have very, very limited options for aftercare at this late hour, July 18th. Pearson Town starts. My son has been waitlisted with several others. I alone received 80 responses to my social media post asking if people had been admitted. Please address this crisis immediately with all of your resources and thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Olson. And after that, we'll have Antonio Jones. My name is Rebecca Olson. I'm not wearing glasses, so I can't focus completely on you right now. Um, I, too, am a parent. Um, my name is Rebecca Olson. I am a parent of a rising first grader. Good. Okay, good. At Club Boulevard. Um, and to echo the sentiment, actually, of my colleague, I'm an assistant public defender in Durham. My husband is an assistant district attorney also in Durham. We are both working parents. I am here about the aftercare situation. Um, I made the fatal flaw of going to work at nine o'clock in the morning and going into court and representing indigent defendants. And I should have been on the listserv trying to get into aftercare. 
I think I came back to the office and submitted my application around 1051 and I was told I was waitlisted at Club Boulevard. Um, we have been waitlisted now with Durham Parks and Rec. We have been, I've gotten no response from several other organizations that have done aftercare. And I did secure aftercare at the YMCA, but it's clear across town, which is a bit defeating the purpose and that we will have to leave at two o'clock, which is not a lunch hour recognized in the courts <laughs> to get my child, to bring him across town and then to bring him back. Um, it will certainly cut into the day in terms of after school, which was already a rush situation, to probably spending about an hour and a half with him that evening. Um, I do appreciate, I know that um, Ms. Valladares, you did say that you were having a meeting about it. One of the things that concerned me was the idea of rotating staff members, support staff, staggering their schedule from noon to six or seven o'clock to accommodate the after school needs. And I'm glad I was here because I heard that woman who is a member of the support staff working three jobs. I'm in a very, probably a more unique situation. I certainly know based on the job I have, I have a husband, we are both committed. And when I can't pick up the slack, God, thank God he's there to pick up the slack. I don't know what single parents do. I don't know what parents who work three jobs and have to bounce from here, there and there. But I was thinking as opposed to taking them out of the classroom support staff, why not incentivize it and ask the, pe the people in that school, hey, do you wanna pick up a Monday for aftercare? Do you wanna pick up a Tuesday? And financially make it worth their while. People shouldn't be working three jobs. They shouldn't. I was like, one is probably enough. And then you have your families. But if you made it financially reasonable to say a per diem, I don't know, $100 for four hours, $150 for four hours, where they would say, fine, you know what? I can actually quit my other job. We also have some of the finest universities right here in our backyard, masters of education, whether it be at Central where I am an alma mater of, I just asked you to consider this so that my kid can actually be in aftercare and we can maintain our employment. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Antonio Jones be our last speaker for this evening. to get myself situated. Antonio Jones, um, I'm actually here to talk about the Growing Together um, student reassignment proposal. And if I can, so Antonio Jones, I'm representing uh, the chair of Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People. I am also a former Durham Public School employee. I am also a father of a Durham Public School um, student. I am also a student of public policy. So back in undergraduate, I had an assignment by the uh, late Professor David Anderson to research Durham Public Schools. I didn't ask for the assignment, he gave it to me. So this is the official merger plan from 30 years ago. So if you hadn't seen it, you can check this out, Duke University, this is the official plan. So 30 years ago, it was a group of folks that came together to merge Durham Public Schools and City Schools. At that time, well, since that time, DPS has only grown 18%. Durham County, since 1990, has grown 80%. People are making the conscious decision to, to find other educational options. So the history is real. We have a moment in time when we can actually go back and leave status quo alone and change history and change the trajectory of Durham Public Schools. You know, there's been a lot of questions about the financial cost of what it means to move forward. Well, it has cost DPS hundreds of millions of dollars over the years by not moving, making a progressive, student boundary policy that reflects the needs of this county. One of the things in this book right here that it talks about is the political will. I'm, I'm gonna read just a few. What it says is in the spirit of the task force presents this report today, meaning this report, discuss it, debate it, dissect it, decide on what actions to take. But in the final analysis, please have the political courage to act. For our report indicates that we know what the problems are but we must muster up the will and resources to act together. This was 30 years ago. So here we are today discussing the next move for Durham Public Schools, the cost savings. And we'll be talking about removing trailers. And I believe that Aaron and Paul can verify that we spent over $2 million each year on just the magnet school transportation. 
They can also verify that Durham Public Schools has the most complex busing system in the state. Five or 10 school bus drivers call out that cause the domino effect that parents feel every single day. So moving forward, how do we move forward? Keep in mind that Durham is growing. Durham is, is, is will be growing in all of the businesses that are coming. People will have discretionary income to send their kids where they want to send their kids to. So tonight, we can change history tonight by putting Durham Public Schools on the path to success. And I want to thank all of the administrators that have worked on this. Most of you came into Durham Public Schools and tried to untangle 30 years of bad policy, 30 years of convoluted policy, 30 years of confusing policy. Most, there are very few people in Durham that can actually tell you and articulate the attendance policy of Durham Public Schools because it's too confusing. Today is the day to unravel that and move forward and be very progressive about the next 30, the next 60 years in Durham Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. That concludes our public comments. The next item on our agenda is our consent items. We have a pretty lengthy list of consent items that have been sent to board members in advance um, to be reviewed extensively. Um, Madam Chair, uh, the on the consent agenda, number N is both on consent and 9A. Um, if we approve it in consent, we uh, is is fruitless to speak about it on nine. So I think we remove it from. Is that different? They're the, they're the same under chief of staff. Okay, I mean, so what? How do we proceed with the? It's my understanding that it's on consent by accident. So I I do think that um, pulling it from consent and then. So I would just get a motion to approve everything in the consent agenda except for item N, I think will be sufficient. And then you'll address that when uh, with, with the chief of staff's uh, 9A. Okay. Well, so I, I move approval of the consent agenda minus item number N. Second. Second. Been moved by Mr. Lee, seconded by Ms. Byer. Any other discussion? Yeah, I have a discussion too. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I have support uh, approving the agenda. However, I want to just uh, call attention to uh, call attention to consent item M, which is the Board of Education stipend. Um, in conversations with our classified staff, it, it has been a point of um, much discussion that everybody's getting raises, it seems, and classified staff feel left out. And I, I did say that I was hearing and I was listening, even coming into this board meeting having conversations with folks and just uh, wanting us to have more discussions about classified staff. Um, approving this agenda and approving the stipend, taking any stance on the stipend and, and doing that would only be a gesture. And I explained, you know, that I, I hear the sentiment. I'm not um, going to use this particular point um, in any way because it would only be a gesture. What they really want is, um, they want to make sure that we are acknowledging many years of advocacy around raising um, also their wage. And so for classified staff, I just want you all to know that I appreciate all the engagement. I know it's been multiple engagements, multiple meetings. Um, I did say that I don't want to do gestures. I think that we definitely um, are working as a district and our superintendent is working. Um, our all our staff or admins are working and the bonuses, I understand the bonuses are not, um, or the 2.5% raise and the bonus is not enough, but I, I wanted to make sure that I called attention to this because I said when in conversations, this was something that is not missed. I, I'm not missing this, that everybody seems to be getting a raise. And I hear that, I hear that sentiment that it seems like stipends are going up, certified teachers are getting, <clears throat> Everybody seems to get, be getting something, and the classified side is, is also getting something, but that 2.5% um, and the bonus of 1,500 uh, just doesn't, is not uh, satisfactory for classified staff. And I thank you for all for the advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vyadar. Is there any other discussion? Mr. Raven. Uh, just one comment. When I'm looking at the physical printed out um, agenda, 
it's a, it differs from the board doc. So I'm not sure which one is the is the standard, but the one that's in board docs, it only goes through P and the physical printed out one goes through Q. So I think we just need to specify specifically the um, what the N you're talking about. It sounds like you're talking about in policy 4316 student dress code. Okay, okay. So any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you all. The next item is our chief of staff. Um, she has two items on our agenda. I'll pass it on to Ms. Giovanni. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Mubanga, board members. If you recall at the work session earlier this month, we presented a draft policy 4316 student dress code. At that time, the board provided feedback I did incorporate that feedback into the new draft to it clarifying um, that we weren't gonna limit it to spring break. We were gonna give principals um, leeway as to when they needed to do refreshers on the proposed dress code. Also clarified required training um, based on feedback from the board members, including implementation training on that for all staff and not just um, school-based teachers um, and IAs, but everyone, including bus monitors, bus drivers, central office staff, everyone would be provided with training on the proposed dress code. In the praises, it does also indicate that if the board does adopt the policy at this meeting, there will be a technical correction needed to the student code of conduct. Um, we will remove, we would remove the dress code um, from that. And then also based on some additional feedback that came um, earlier today, I will be clarifying what the disciplinary measures could be. Um, Currently in the, as it's listed in the 4301 dress code, it's clear that it's a level 1A. And I believe in the policy, um, it indicates level one. So we would need to clarify that so that it tracks according to what the board does, um, has done in the past. But with that, um, I believe that the board had, um, I did not receive any additional feedback from anyone. And so I do present this policy um, in final form at this time. Board members, are there any questions? Mr. Sears. I would just make a motion to approve the policy as amended with the technical revision stated. It's been moved by Mr. Sears, seconded by Ms. Valladares. Is there any other discussion? I had a question. Just wanted to make sure I'm actually trying to look through it here. Uh, I was watching the board meeting uh, previously when we talked about this and there was a discussion about uh, hats. Um, I'm just having trouble finding it here, what we landed on with that. At the time, when originally the policy was brought to principals, students, staff, et cetera, hats and hoodies were included. After those meetings, it was the determination of administration that they not be recommended to okay. the board. And that is the final version of the policy at this time. It does not include the, those are all stri the strikeouts from before were made permanent that okay. we will not, uh, hats and hoodies would not be allowed. Okay, okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. It passes unanimously. Thank you, uh, Ms. Giovanni, and to the students and educators who have worked on this. We've heard a lot of positive feedback, so I really appreciate you all doing this work. The next item on our agenda, excuse me, Ms. Giovanni. Thank you again. At this time, the administration brings to the board the, some information regarding the actions of DPS in supporting safe spaces for our LGBTQ plus students. Just by way of history, um, in 2016, uh, this board led um, in North Carolina by adopting LGBT gender guidelines with the support of uh, Mr. Kinsu at the time. Um, he did draft those in 2018, as with all policies and practices and guidelines, you have to be responsive to what's happening um, in the world. And in 2018, Dr. Kelvin Bullock, myself and Mr. Matt Hickson met on several occasions to work on um, updating the guidelines. 
as I want to say, uh, then the pandemic occurred. And so that got set to the side earlier. Well, maybe I'd say this school year, there were some, we began to hear some issues um, from some of our families that the guidelines that we led with, right, in 2016 were maybe not being um, as understood as they could be and that we needed to maybe refresh them, update them and do some additional things. So in 2022, we did work with um, Darrington Smith on updating those guidelines and addressing some of those concerns. And so I would actually ask you to pull up the presentation on this. And at this time, ask Dr. Kelvin Bullock, the Executive Director for Equity Affairs, and Dr. Laverne Maddox-Perry, the Senior Executive Director for Student Support Services to come forward and share with this board and the community some of the things that Durham Public Schools is doing to support our LGBTQ plus um, students and staff. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. Good evening, Board of Education, Dr. Mubenga and DPS community. It is my pleasure this evening to bring you a brief update regarding some of the ways in which DPS is seeking to create and support safe spaces for students that identify as part of the LGBTQIA plus community in our schools. I'm joined this evening by Dr. Maddox Perry, Senior Executive Director of Student Support Services. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. I'd like to start with a little historical data that's important to set the context of where we are today. On this slide, you will see some information that was compiled by district leaders, counselors, and social workers back in 2016 when we adopted those original guidelines that Ms. Giovanni referred to. Um, this was information that was compiled regarding the prevalence of safe spaces in LGBTQ clubs in DPS. You will note that many of these bullet points speak specifically to practices that were in place in our secondary schools. Um, I added to this slide the fourth bullet point which speaks to how most of our schools, including many of our elementary schools today, have sought to create safe spaces and practices via counseling services and sometimes materials provided in media centers. Not in terms of counseling services, that does go across schools and we are providing training and supporting with our counselors and social workers. And we'll share a little bit more about that as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. In terms of our GSAs, our Gay Straight Alliances and our LGBTQ clubs, um, these are some of the guiding principles that we have in place for those clubs. You will see that they seek to ally with others to increase safety, family involvement and student achievement. There's a notion to increase safety and sense of belonging for LGBTQ people in schools. And there's also a principle of increasing visibility and support for our LGBTQ students in order to promote self-esteem, academic achievement, and respect for diversity. Next slide, please. So, some of you may remember, and again, Chief of Staff Giovanni referred to this, that back in 2015, 2016, DPS leadership, including board members, principals, and cabinet, received legal updates and guidance regarding transgender students specifically from Therrington Smith. This guidance materialized into um, a document that was after the training with principals, we had principals who would often request this guidance um, when, if they were facing a situation where they needed support and guidance in supporting a transgender student. So DPS used this guidance this year, this 21-22 school year, as the foundation for our updated gender support guidelines. And this was placed on the DPS website back in March of this year. As we share these guidelines, the Office of Equity Affairs and Student Support Services work together to facilitate training for principals, district leaders, and also counselors and social workers. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, we just have a brief example. Um, and again, this is um, training that was provided for 
counselors and social workers K-12. And also um, we had several trainings for principals K-12 on, um, on the updated guidelines and creating safe spaces for LGBTQ students also. But this is an example of some of um, the content of those trainings. We uh, emphasize the need for employees to affirm the preferred pronouns of students and, and colleagues and to avoid gendered language, um, i.e., you know, um, referring to a class as boys and girls or um, saying, hey, guys, things of that nature where we're gendering students um, unnecessarily. So we also encourage leaders to consider including pronouns and in introductions as they might contribute, as they sometimes contribute to the creation of a safe space for LGBTQ students. Other examples of that may be, for example, in my email signature, I have my pronouns listed there. Um, when I sign into Zoom, depending on the Zoom account that's popping up, my pronouns will pop up in Zoom. I never know what's, what name is going to show up there, but I do have set as my default that my pronouns will populate in Zoom. At this time, I'm going to yield to Dr. Maddox Perry for the next slide, and she is going to speak to a little bit about the training that we've been provided and some of the things that we're putting in place moving forward. Dr. Maddox Perry. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. Good evening, everyone. Good to be with you. As a collaborative endeavor, the Office of Equity Affairs and Student Support Services have developed implementation strategies for ensuring our school community fully understands and follows our updated gender support guidelines through professional learning offerings. School-based student services and district level administrators have begun a series of learning sessions to not only have clarity on the guidance we've received because this comes from our legal counsel, but also to guarantee every child attending Durham Public Schools feels equally supported, capable of success, and welcomed as a valuable asset in our school community. As you can see on the slide, we've already completed refresher training for some staff members and newer administrators and staff members as well as our school-based student services staff. As a part of our partnership with ASCA and our renewing our commitment to a high quality counseling program, our counselors, in addition to their regular training, are participating and following the ASCA position, which is that school counselors recognize all students and that they have the right to be treated equally and fairly with dignity and respect as unique individuals, free from discrimination, harassment, and bullying based on the real or perceived gender identity and gender expression. School counselors work to safeguard the well being of transgender and gender nonconforming youth. In addition to our counselors, other school-based and district level uh, student services personnel are also having an overall goal to ensure safety, comfort and healthy development of the students, maximizing inclusion and improving social integration while minimizing exclusion and stigma stigmatization. Additionally, we look forward to offering trainings during our upcoming leadership retreat for all school administrators, central office administrators. We also are engaging in individual coaching with selected principals who are in need of additional support when dealing with issues that may arise when it comes to supporting our students. We also are working to make sure that everyone understands the full range of the diversity spectrum and that it includes many, many different types of students. We also utilize our leadership weekly and other newsletters to inform our administrators and principals, notes from Nakia to give resources and advise our teachers and other instructional staff. Our DPS celebrate monthly planning um, with uh, Melissa Perez and Kelly Stevens from CNI. It's a website to help celebrate different cultural celebrations, and it includes resources and ideas for activities. This month, there are highlights for the History of Pride Month, articles, and other educational resources as a public-facing 
opportunity to reaffirm our LGBTQ plus students and our support. We've also increased and enhanced partnerships with local experts or like-minded stakeholders. The LGBTQ Center of Durham is partnering with Student Services, Office of Equity Affairs, as well as CNI to continue to advise and offer training for our staff. And lastly, Student Support Services and other academic services departments are revisiting and re-emphasizing our guidance on school level bullying prevention, as well as our central office bullying reporting, follow-up, and investigative outcomes. Board members, this was um, before you for information today, but I would ask them to remain just in case they need to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Giovanni, and thank you, Dr. Bullock, um, Ms. Maddox Perry, for the presentation. Uh, I'll start with Ms. Byer. Questions? I want to start with just appreciation for all the work you all are doing and the way you are centering and lifting this up as an important um, part of our equity work. Um, and please don't take questions as criticism because y'all are doing a lot. Um, while it felt like when we did things in 2016, we were leading the state, it feels like right now we've got work to do. And I know y'all are um, seeing that both in, in conversations with students and parents, but also um, in our schools. And so I appreciate like hearing about safe spaces, but we can't stop until the entire school community is a safe space, right? It's not a separate place. Um, so I do think we need better policy. I think we need stronger policy. Um, and I look forward to, to how we work on that together. Um, I, I'm glad to hear you're partnering with the LGBTQ Center of Durham. Um, I think we need to invest a lot more and, and make sure it is in elementary and pre-K all the way through to support every child, every family. Um, are we doing gender support plans? Um, that was a question that someone had emailed me that I didn't know the answer to. Um, do, are we currently doing the practice of gender support plans within CPS? So they can go ahead. Yes, we are. That was included. That was one of the things that I think is different in what Durham is doing with our guidelines than what some other school systems are doing. It is what that support plan looks like is going to vary depending on the student. We are not going to follow the cookie cutter. You know, we're going to contact the um, work with the family and that student. And I'll go ahead and let Dr. Bullock and Maddox Perry give a little more detail without obviously, you know, indicating what students we've used it with, but just kind of what that looks like. Thank you, um, Ms. Giovanni. Yeah, I would say in terms of our gender support plans, it does vary depending on the needs of the student. The essence of the gender support plan is to meet with the student, understand what their needs are, um, and in, to provide an example. We've had situations where we have to make, we work with the student and the parent to make accommodations with, say, a restroom or making sure that kids have safe spaces um, where, um, well, for example, they have a dedicated restroom that they can go to not necessarily be outed, things of that nature. And so, it, but it really varies depending on the particular situation. So, um, so yeah, in, in different levels, we have different um, practices we're putting in place to support children. Is that a, like a standardized document? Like the one I saw online was like five pages long, which seemed a little extra. But it, it, do we have a standard document that we're using that we could share with families and make us accessible? Or is it already on our website? It's um, so I, I think we don't have a standardized. We are following the guidance and best practices from um, all the uh, experts in the field from ASCA and sharing that with our counselors. Um, what is most important about the um, gender support plans that we've seen is that they have been multidisciplinary and always include trusted members of the student um, uh, students community and um, the school works together to define 
exactly how there will be support provided to the student. Um, and it, it has ranged from everything from preparing for disclosure at the student's request to, as I said, creating safe spaces if there have been instances where it hasn't felt as welcoming. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? If a parent needs or a student, you know, it's like we need to create this gender support plan for students who are currently in our schools or might be coming, where do they go to make that request and, and develop a team to work on that together? Well, I'm always going to say the student support services, but any trusted adult in the building and administrator should be aware of that. Um, really, a parent doesn't necessarily have to request that if there is something that is disclosed to a member of student services or an administrator, the decision to follow the guidelines would mean that you would consider if a gender support plan is something that's needed for that student. Also, I appreciated you talking about coaching um, because it's clearly a learning journey for lots of folks, all folks. Um, and I especially think as um, folks are moving here from other areas of the country, um, they, they bring a wealth of knowledge and experience and curricular materials. And I'm so glad that our families are willing to partner with us and also challenge us because um, I think it's, it's so, so important for um, them to be in partnership with us. Um, I hope that we budgeted enough to make sure that curricular materials are available, that books are in schools. I hope that we're holding ourselves and our, our people that are choosing materials accountable to get the best that we can in, in this space as well. Um, I don't know. I just look forward to policy changes because I do agree that it starts both top and ground. But yeah, I think forward to seeing what we can improve. Um, I really have always admired the, the policy that Orange County brought forth um, and the practices there. So look forward to continuing this discussion. Oh, talk, no, that's not what I was saying. <laughs> no, sorry. Come on back. <laughs> that was not that nod. The nod was, <laughs> I wanted to speak, if you all could speak a little bit to the Orange County policy guidelines and how they manage that. I know they worked with our same attorneys at Farrington Smith and there's been some questions um, regarding can, what does that look like? And what does that mean? Y'all sit tight, don't go anywhere. So I think um, obviously as an educational institution, we all should be learning all the time. And I just wanna kind of lead with that um, to the board as a response that we are absolutely um, always trying to learn and improve. And one of the things that precipitated the new website that um, Dr. Bullock's office created with all of these resources is an understanding that you can do better. If you can do better, then you need to be working on that. And so what that looks like is we wanna make sure we're collaborating with all of our community members, our staff members, and figuring out really what those needs are. And if it is necessary that we tweak the guidelines, like we've actually adjusted, one of the reasons that we preferred to do the guidelines versus um, doing the guidelines that Orange has and putting them into the policy manual is that it allows administration to change things. For example, from the time we started working on those guidelines, cisgender was in there. And then as we worked with um, members of the LGBTQ plus community, it was determined that maybe cisgender wasn't necessarily a favorite term or a preferred term. And so it was requested that we remove that. Gender non-conforming was then determined even from the start to currently that that's a negative thing, the saying that you're not conforming to gender. So really what that language looks like, we wanted to make sure that we could be agile and pivot and be responsive. I do wanna clarify, and, I don't, and Rod's gonna jump in here in a minute, but I do wanna clarify that the regulations that slash guidelines that you see in orange, um, our guidelines have the exact same strength and import and effect that those do as well. So there's not, they're not followed closer or more strict, stringently. We have adopted, administration has adopted these guidelines just like administration in Orange did. And every member of the Durham Public Schools staff and community is required to follow those guidelines as they are adopted. And they are now easily accessible um, on that new um, LGBTQ um, webpage that Dr. Bullock has created. So with that, I would ask as Rod, um, just to kind of share a little bit about Orange compared to um, Durham. I believe that's what you're asking, Chair Umstead? Okay. 
So we had the lawyer for Orange who worked on the Orange um, guidelines, review them, and she provided a memo, which I can share with get to the board, um, outlining the basic differences between the two. Um, she did tell me that she felt that your guidelines, you know, as written are, are okay. Um, there's some stuff we might want to do to clean it up, make it a little more um, understandable in some places, but in terms of it covering all of the major things in the same manner in which Orange does, she felt that you were generally about in the same place. So um, I don't think you need any major overhaul at all to to get similar to Orange, if that's what you're interested in doing. It sounds like you're pretty close to that based on based on her analysis of it. And I would just point out that there's very little difference between the administration adopting guidelines like you've done, with the, like your administration has done, and, and placing those guidelines as guidelines or as regulations and procedures in your policy manual. I mean, it really is, it's not really board policy in either place. Um, and I do think that what Ms. Giovanni said is really the most important thing, especially in this area, is having the, given the administration the flexibility to make changes quickly as those come up and not necessarily having to go through all of the procedures that would be required to actually revise a policy just so that they can stay nimble and, and stay out in front of the issues. Yeah, Rod, I really appreciate that. I just also think that there's something explicit about having something be policy that that speaks to its importance to families um, and having it live as board policy. Uh, yeah, we can be agile and change policy as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah. I, I could I could see why people want the board to have a board policy that feels more protective and more overarching. And it it what what why are you making two lawyer faces that say I don't understand because I no, need no, to understand. No no, 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 it's not saying you don't. I just will be clear that oranges is not a policy; it's a regulation. So I mean, if if what you wanted to do is to have the to ultimately take the superintendent's regulations and and kind of attach them to a policy. So that they appear in your policy manual. I, I mean, that's again that there's very little technical difference between the two. But if it appearing in your policy manual makes you feel better, then that's certainly something that we can work with the administration on doing. But I still think you would want to leave it as a regulation attached to a policy and make it clear that the superintendent can make whatever changes are necessary and keep it posted in the policy manual as you proceed. That would just be my recommendation. But you're obviously a free as the board to do whatever you choose. Ms. Barr, did you have additional? Well, no, that's super helpful. Um, I think one thing I wonder sometimes, like as we're building new schools, are we actually changing the way we're doing bathroom design, right? Do, and I don't know that, <laughs> look, Dr. Monk just came in as I'm asking the impossible question. Are we, are we even changing the way we construct buildings to be more inclusive with bathroom design was a question, Dr. Monk, and I don't mean to hit you with it as you walk yeah, back I, in. I can't answer that confidently right now, is what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Byer. Ms. Valladares. Thank you all so much. I have um, had conversations. Uh, Ms. Giovanni, you're leading intersectional work. Your work is dress code policy, you know, uh, Dr. Maddox, you've done restorative practices. You're each, you know, Dr. Bullock, you're, you're all collaborating along the lines of ensuring that our schools are safe for everyone, for every student. There shouldn't be any, um, uh, any, any, any student, and especially when you think about the, defi the definition of, um, and clauses about discrimination, discrimination on race, gender, class, sexuality, uh, orientation, um, uh, country of origin. So we continue to work as a district to make sure that we are providing the safest space for our children. Um, I do have a question in terms of policy because I have also heard, um, had conversations. I've also seen uh, the progress that we're making, but we keep hearing that it's not, um, it, 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 it doesn't reach that, it, it's okay. I've heard that too, it's, it's okay, but it, it, you know, it could be better. Um, and so I think about policies like Title IX, you know, we have, 
we know that that's federal, um, and yet we have our own uh, interpretation of, of what that means here, right, for Title IX. Is there an opportunity to link that with, to, I'm trying to figure out in terms of like how to make, um, make that connection to, 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 to these policies and more than, than a guideline. The other thing that we heard also is about bathrooms, um, bathroom spaces. And one of the things I think, this is not intentional in the presentation, but the notion of safe, uh, safe spaces, when I think about, do we have safe spaces for immigrant students? Do we have safe spaces for black students? Do we have safe spaces for um, students with disabilities? Do we have safe spaces? And so, that's where I'm going with um, a little bit of the unintended um, things in the presentation. I, I think all our schools, and I, and I think that's, that's part of the thing, all our schools should be safe for every student. And so how do we approach that in a way that doesn't unintentionally mean that this is the safe space and maybe, you know, whatever connotations people can ascribe to the rest of the school? Um. Thank you for that question, Ms. Valladares. Is um, one of the things that comes to mind um, with with the latter part of that is around the work that we've kind of instilled in our Equity 101 professional learning, and we start our Equity professional learning in the district around the topic of identity and intersectionality and understanding. Um, how levels of privilege and there can be biases attached to different aspects of our identity. I really think that um, moving forward, we have to continue to dig deep in, in the conversation of intersectionality and how a person's gender, gender identity, race, um, country of national origin, um, language, things of that nature all kind of play together to create a unique experience for each person. And if we can think about like for any person who's identifying with any historically marginalized community, how do we create, make sure that our schools are safe spaces for all of those identities. And so, you know, as we move forward, we want to continue to dive deeper into just all of these aspects of identity. And we've done some initial trainings around that we've you know, had levels of that conversation in our Equity 101 and every year with new teacher orientation, we make that a part of the conversation. Um, but there, there's room grow, to grow also there in diving deeper in that. And I'm, I was all, also thinking with student support services, with counselors, um, the ways in which they go about trying to create a safe space for all students, like it, it really has to be a conversation about you know, all these different aspects of identity and making sure that, you know, we see our commonalities within each other, but we also see and respect our differences. So I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that, Dr. Maddox Perry, but those are some of my initial thoughts and things that we can do to explore the, these different topics of identity. I will add, Ms. Ryder, is real quick after you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know you were coming up. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just echo what he said and that it is a part of our work too. I said before the full range of diversity and just making sure that we begin with safe spaces to hopefully identify allies and people that students who are having difficulty or not feeling that there is a place for them to go to know there is somewhere to begin and then to continue to educate until we can have that be the full healthy supportive climate at the school. I would just say, I think maybe for expeditiously, I think we're saying safe, but we also, there's so many other adjectives that we in practice and we're meeting and collaborating, we're including and welcoming is one that, you know, you don't want to be tolerated. And I think that's what I've heard from several members that no one wants to just feel like they are being tolerated. They want to feel like during public schools, the spaces are safe, they're loving and they're welcoming. And so as we continue to listen and adjust and stay agile, I think that those are really um, kind of where the hard work is that we are doing. So I just, just wanted to add that, thank you. Thank you, I just have one more comment. Um, so the I'm hearing that the nature of this safe space is a, a, a space that is welcoming, affirming, um, which we, you know we've talked about all our schools should be affirming of all the intersectionality, um, the diversity of our families. 
my concern is that I'm not too sure that there are resources and I think we can continue this conversation further. What are the resources that are available in those spaces? If they're meant to be spaces that are um, places where, um, almost, almost like places to, to go to, but for the purpose of safety, I, I just, I can't wrap my head around somebody having to run to a place to feel safe. Now, I do know that if it's a resource area, then that's, that's a different conversation. Um, and then the other thing that I did also um, hear was that it's implicit in the, in the uh, presentation that it's schools, and it says schools in plural, um, but it doesn't say all schools. And so, you know, there's like the question of whether it's like all our schools, you know, uh, inclusive of all our schools. And I just, these are things that I, that I, that I, um, even coming to this board meeting, there were, you know, I had conversations and that was, those were some of the questions as well. So it, it is um, implicit. I'm, uh, we didn't include it explicitly, but absolutely it is all schools. And as you all know, so Title IX, um, that sits in my uh, department. And so that's a minimum, right? That what we're saying is that you cannot be discriminated against the federal law on the basis of your sex, but that's the lowest bar that, you know, the federal law starts at. That's not where we, you know, that's not where we, we're trying to be in Durham. And so I just want to continue to reiterate, and I think Mrs. Byer and Ms. Vyadars is also indicated that we continue these conversations. And I think that's why it was, an, um, I just want to thank Chair Umstead for um, allowing us to come today and provide some of the information regarding what we're doing and just keep the lines of communication open to our community that's watching. They can reach out to Drs. Bullock, Maddox Perry, uh, myself, to kind of share some additional ideas. Um, and but of course, as always, you know, we always want to de defer to the actual, you know, the educators on what is, you know, how they're going to implement that using their expertise. But making sure that they too are learning, right? Like we never should stop learning and understanding. So, thank you, Ms. Lewis. Thank you so much for this presentation and for all the work that uh, Student Support Services and Equity Affairs is doing under your leadership, um, Ms. Giovanni. When, I just wanted to weigh in on the, the policy discussion and the guidelines. And first, I just want to uplift all the hard work that went into our equity policy that involved many community members and diverse folks at the table for several months. I, I can't even remember how long we were meeting to getting this policy, <laughs> years maybe, to getting this equity policy um, approved, brought to the board to be approved. So I know that when the conversation first began, I said, well, where does this sit in our equity policy? And there is language that addresses equity across the board that is inclusive and speaks to inclusion, safe spaces, um, and, and that. So I, I know there's that policy that's there. It's important to remember, and you all brought this up very well in your presentation, that policy and guidelines are, are important for sure, but without connecting to the practice, without connecting to training, it's just gonna be an uphill battle. We're not gonna see it realized unless people are trained and we're having these tough conversations. So I definitely appreciate the training that you all shared with us that's happening, the level setting and the coaching that is occurring, because it sounds like there's been some things that have already been identified and is being addressed. It's really important. So whether policy or guidelines, and I hear you, Ms. Giovanni, policy has less ability to be fluid. I'm confident that we have our policy in the equity affairs, the equity policy um, that is inclusive. And I like that our guidelines allows us to be fluid. We need to make sure the training is incurring so that students are able to learn in a safe space. Um, thank you, Mr. Malone, Mr. Malone, also for the clarification that there are places where we can strengthen um, the guidelines, there's more work to be done as well. And just to the community, those who have made, came and made public comment, is super important that we continue to lean in on those with lived experiences, those closest to the inequities, to hear your voices, to be a part of the discussion, the trainings that need to happen, the things that are happening behind closed doors and bringing those to light. So keep talking to us, keep letting us know what's happening so that it can be addressed. You have a supportive board administration to meet the needs of our students and staff. And I hope that you can hear that. I didn't have a question. I just want to thank you for your, the work that's happening and being clear that we do have a policy with our equity policy and our guidelines gives us more um, mobility and that you are always addressing this and getting us to change. We've got to continue to engage the community, those with lived experience to help um, get us closer to where we need to be for all of our students. Uh, Mr. Raven. 
I just say I think you all are already off to a great start with this. I think you already heard Ms. Byers' challenge to kind of put Durham back in the lead um, of when we're looking at, at equity and inclusion. The, the one thing that I just wanted to kind of put in the back of our minds is when, when we're looking at the, I guess, the intersectionality uh, between our community with special needs and their LGBTQIA plus community is there, there's just from what, from what I've been able to read, there's a higher percentage of that community that does identify with that community. So when we're thinking about access, and I'm not necessarily meaning like the, the ADA type of access because all of our schools are suited for that, but just as you all have kind of said, the welcoming to, to make sure that they feel included and, and that we're intentional in that, I just hope that we continue to move forward with that as well. So thank you all. Thank you. I I wanna make some comments before I head back around to, to the second round of comments. I wanna thank you to the families who, who continue to advocate and push us and show up at meetings over and over and over again, who made your way down to Fuller Building to be vulnerable and share your experiences. And also again, continue to challenge us and push us. I have a couple of like thoughts around and some of them have been shared before about where we need to go next. Um, I'm gonna give y'all one critique in talking about safe spaces. I really like using the term safer spaces because we can't determine whether a space is safe or not for a person, right? So we wanna strive to create safer spaces to greater allow that person to decide what's safe or not for them. I think another thing is what we are hearing from families and then what we're hearing in our guidelines, there's a gap there. And some of the things that we're talking about in our boardroom some of the things that we're hearing about that are going well in some of our schools, there's a gap between those things that are going really well and some of the places that we need to grow. And I wanna push us to really do some of that growth because um, that's gonna be growth work for all of us. For some folks who are not familiar with pronouns and not familiar with gender identity and fluidity and what that means, this is gonna be a learning and a growth curve. And I think we're gonna have to push on our folks to like learn and grow with this the only way to change that inequity though is to practice it over and over and over again. So you all talked about doing training with our leaders and district leadership. I think that's important to have those open, honest and really good conversations and pushing them. But I also think we need for our bus drivers and bus monitors and custodial staff and all those other folks who are working with our students, teachers to have that same level of training and support. So that's a whole lot of people I know <laughs> to educate, but I think there are ways that we could be being strategic about who we empower to lead some of those trainings to make sure that everyone has it and then continue like we did with the dress code. We said we're going to have to refresh it. We're going to need to continue to refresh this learning to make sure that we are continuing to update our own learning and interrupting our practices and make sure we're moving towards creating safer spaces for our students. I think we could, I could see adding in our equity policy language around gender support guidelines. I think we need to be more public about we have these gender support guidelines. I've talked to educators who are like, I didn't know this existed. And I'm, I identify as LGBTQ. I want to be, you know, I wanted to know this. So I think we need to be more public about what exists and what we're doing to support. So thank you all for putting, uh, putting this presentation together. I asked to put it on the agenda because I knew that we had a lot of questions. And I want to acknowledge we got a lot of work to do to make sure we're getting to where we need to be. I hope that we can be leaning into some of the GSAs at our schools to learn from our students about their experiences and have them help lead and shape some of the conversations moving forward. I'm sure they could lead some great trainings with staff or have conversations to make sure we're moving in the right direction. So I would say lean into that as much as we can because those are the folks that we're here to serve. Um, I think that is concludes what I had to say a comment. I wanna come back to Ms. Byer and then Ms. Valladares. Did you have something Ms. Lee? Okay. Oh, thank you, Chair Umstead. That was uh, brilliantly said. I, yeah, I, I um, am inspired by, by your vision. I wondered, you know, sitting here, it's been great having families come down here every month, but I don't want folks to be a little frustrated, right? And I do want us to have a place for more student voice and more employee voice. We've got employee expertise as we continue to see at our podium. I, w I think this board in policy can empower task forces, work groups, something. And I wonder if we would consider that going forward as one strategy where we empower a group that comes together quarterly with, with some students, with some parents, with some staff, with LGBTQ community member leadership, like where we could dream kind of how to accelerate this work um, together so that um, folks can more spend their time 
working on the improvements and things that they're seeing that that need to be updated and changed um, rather than kind of hanging out in board meetings late at night. Um, that was just one thought I had. I have um, a short comment, but this is um, feedback that I, across the board in DPS when it comes to discrimination. The question is, how do we ensure that it's standardized, that it's not happening, that we actually have, you know, and, and so I hear from, from you all, this is standardized. This is throughout all our schools. This is our guideline. It is just as equal as any other policy. So when we have a uh, different, uh, we talked about intersectionality with all the groups that experience marginalization, our black students, our, our immigrant students, English as a second language, um, our LGBTQIA2 plus students, everybody needs to know that we take discrimination serious. We take, um, we take anything that is making our kids Anything that is provide like, that is posing a barrier to their success, to their learning, to their ability to breathe, you know, to their ability to be who they are, um, we take this seriously. And so um, I just wanted to say that and thank you so much for the work that you've been doing. I know you've been engaging in the conversations. I just wanted to make sure that that standardization is is clear with this. That this is all throughout all our schools. Safety is safety in all ways, in all the forms. So thank you so much. So this is before the board for information. When I think about next steps, though, I would, I do think we would want to see some, how do we connect the guidelines to our policy? So maybe bringing some options to that, to make that connection, to make it stronger. And then I think I will leave it to the administration to determine if there are other next steps you can bring back to us. But I think that would be a clear next step to make sure we're making some progress. And I, that memo from Therrington Smith also, that you said that you could share, Mr. Malone, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Malone will forward it along. Thank, thank you all. The next item on our agenda is operation services. We have a community transportation update. I'm gonna hand it to Dr. Monk. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, Board of Education and Dr. Mavanga. I'm joined tonight by uh, Mr. P Matthew Palmer and Ms. Kristen Brookshire, who is our transportation planner. And they're gonna give us an update on what they've been working on um, to make sure that our students have a safe transit to school, whether it's be a bus, car, walking or bike. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Dr. Monk. And good evening again, board and Dr. Mbanga. You know, reality for us is that for our 32,000 students, uh, the school day starts before the bell rings. And it's a point of pride tonight to see Director Harris up here celebrating our strong 200 plus transportation staff, not only our bus drivers, but our bus monitors, our mechanics, our administrators, we appreciate them. Collectively, they support 40% of our students getting to school. 60% of our students arrive by a car, the city bus, walking or biking, all these different modes. And we're very fortunate uh, here at DPS to have Ms. Kristen Brookshire with us as our community transportation planner, making sure that we at DPS have a plan for every student attending school. Uh, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and start the presentation. And I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Brookshire. Ms. Brookshire, please. I think Mr. Palmer and I have some of the same favorite talking points. <laughs> um, you can go ahead and skip to the uh, slide number three. Thank you. Um, board members, Dr. Mubanga, I was very excited to join the school planning team earlier this year in a position that is dedicated to supporting safe, efficient, equitable, and sustainable travel to school. Uh, most of us don't commute for fun. It's something we have to do every day to get where we need to go, to meet the needs of our family, and that's the same thing for our kids. Um, they make that trip twice a day for thousands of days um, during their school career. Um, and these trips don't have to be stressful, dangerous, or a waste of time. I'm excited. I'm really excited about this work. I'm really happy to be here and meet you guys. Um, uh, I think that improving these trips has the potential. Here, I've already heard articulated as I've been meeting people uh, my first few months here, um, such a goal such as enhancing community cohesion, improving safety, um, improving equity, and, and even fitting a little bit more physical activity into our day. Um, I, you know, it keeps me going to imagine the neighborhood that can now have the choice to walk and bike to school, 
um, the kid that is walking with their friends to their school bus stop, um, the family that has a few less frantic minutes in the car together to talk about their day, um, and uh, the student who gets to exercise a little independence using their go pass to get on a, uh, their youth pass to get on a go Durham bus to go to school. Um, so these are experiences that I think shape the way students think about transportation and the choices that they seek out in the future. So I'm glad Mr. Palmer mentioned the recognitions that you guys had earlier for our, um, our school bus transportation staff, because it's well established that school bus transportation is a great way to get to school. Um, and we have staff focused on that here. And so my work is focused on improving the way, the way that our students um, who are getting to school in all the other modes, walking, biking, driving, transit. Um, and then I'm also bringing a pedestrian safety lens as we look at the way that um, we place school, school bus stops in our neighborhoods and how students are accessing those stops. So this work is pursued at every level. So today I will just briefly outline how I'm working both internally and externally to improve multimodal school travel. Um, my hope is that, oh, well, I'm almost there. <laughs> um, so my hope is that this is the beginning of the conversation and that you guys will invite me back to talk um, in more detail about some successes. So now we're on the right slide. Um, so here are just a few examples of how I work internal to DPS to support our schools and our families. Um, I learn from staff and families at schools about what is working well and what's not working well right now about arrival and dismissal and then work with them to define procedures and explore actions that can improve safety for all modes, reduce vehicle queue length, um, and encourage multimodal transportation where possible. Uh, for example, the, the first school that I started working at um, closely was Forest View Elementary to produce a toolkit that includes both short-term and long-term solutions. Um, and it's an ongoing effort that we've ultimately looped in NCDOT and I look forward to you know, implementing some of those things over the next school year. Um, and so some aspects of this work will always be school by school, but there will be aspects, um, you know, I hope that eventually as I work with more schools closely that there are best practices that can be shared um, across the district. Um, and so uh, collaborating internally on school construction, renovation and maintenance, you know, we have schools that are opening very soon and we have others that will be receiving, receiving major renovations. So I'm collaborating with construction and capital planning to define opportunity, opportunities for improving access um, between the community and these schools, uh, as well as circulation on the campus. And then I also foresee some opportunities to enhance transportation access through maintenance projects. And then data, uh, transportation planning and any planning really starts with data. And so part of my role is to collect, monitor, and evaluate data. Next slide. This is just a snapshot of some quantitative data that we started collecting in the 21-22 school year. Currently, this is made possible by our schools doing a monthly show of hands tally of students in their homerooms asking how you got to school today, how are you getting home from school. Um, and as we strive to be uh, a leading school district when it comes to community transportation, it's important to have a baseline for benchmarking our efforts. And then this is the type of data that we'll continue to use um, as we prioritize internal and external projects, uh, apply for funding, and respond to requests for information. Um, and with my previous information, I can say this is, or my previous experience, I can say this is information that most school districts don't have. Um, doesn't mean that they can't back into it and kind of estimate what's going on, but to have um, mode share for every school and to know that month by month. So over a long period of time, there's not a lot of places that are starting with that information. So I'm very thankful to our schools who have been um, participating by submitting their data. Um, and I'll also add that while it's incredibly useful to have this information at our fingertips, I also really value um, qualitative data as well. Um, that data matters to me and I really value people's experiences and, and their perceptions of their transportation and travel options as well. So uh, next slide. So in working externally to represent DPS with the Durham community and beyond, it's important to have a firm grasp of our transportation related needs so that we don't miss an opportunity that's presented to us and so that we're in a great position to seek out new opportunities. Um, a lot of these needs involve filling gaps. I'm sure we can all immediately picture 
a missing sidewalk, um, missing crosswalk, a traffic calming measure that would unlock a transportation option at one school or many schools. I'm sure hopefully you're bringing some to mind. Um, so since day one here, I've been focused on building relationships with our partners at the city, county, MPO, and NCDOT so that the transportation needs of Durham's youth are well represented in transportation planning activities and relevant projects. And, and I honestly think they've been really great about inviting me so far. I've been in many conversations and meetings, you know, uh, and I'm glad that they're happy to have someone at the school district who's constantly thinking about this topic as well. Um, and, and very patient with my questions and ideas as I'm getting up to speed in this role as well. Uh, and in terms of partnering, I, I don't wanna leave tonight without mentioning um, an effort that I, th I think you guys are all familiar with. I walked into a very, very good ongoing collaboration between um, the city, Bike Durham, and our athletics department to make sure that um, we're giving the opportunity for bicycle safety education classes in, the, um, in our older elementary age uh, PE classes. So last slide. Um, and as I wrap, I just want to share that one way I know I've been thinking about this one way that I think I will know I've been doing my job well is if transportation is something that our schools and our families maybe get to think a little less about because the options are clear and they're easy. And that school travel is something that departments within DPS and all of our partners in the community and beyond are thinking a little bit more about something that they're thinking about all the time when they're making transportation decisions. So um, I hope to come back soon and speak with you again. And if you have any questions or ideas that you'd like to share with me tonight. Thank you so much for your presentation and welcome to DPS. Glad to have you Thank here. You. Um, I can't say how many times I've heard, wow, y'all have a transportation planner on your team. Like it's innovative work that we're doing. So I appreciate your presentation. Board members, are there any questions? Uh, I just want to, pre again, uh, just like Chair Olmstead said, appreciate us having a transportation planner on here and that you're working with schools to try to work on getting people, you know, to different modes of transportation, you know, bikes, you know, walking, whatever that may be. And I just, I believe that, you know, as we go on through, uh, we're going to be talking about the growing together plan, I think there's going to be more opportunities for the localized travel, the, the different modes of transportation. And when we started that, um, when we worked with the city to talk about the, um, the students riding the, the bus, right, the student passes a few years ago, and making sure that there's bus stops at, at our high, especially our high schools and things, I think that was a huge a boon for Durham itself. And so to have someone here to advocate for those types of strategies and, and things, it's, it's a really big move for Durham Public Schools. So I really appreciate you being here. Welcome. You know, I'm really glad to see um, you here and someone here to focus on that. Um, I think um, I think we've once done a really good job with transportation overall, but just to have someone focused on there. I just really appreciate, I appreciate this presentation. I appreciate the data and uh, just the ideas that you're gonna have going forward. So thank you so much. Mr. Sears. Yep. Thank you and welcome again. <clears throat> um, I think it's it's worth mentioning that um, there, there are a couple of factors for me that come to mind around um, transportation. My, my own kids are more elementary, so I'm a little more focused at that end of the spectrum, but um, one is, and you all have heard me talk about this ad nauseum, the, this school choice world we're living in, you know, the, the number of miles we put on this community to avoid your neighborhood school for this or that reason. And uh, I'm very hopeful, again, reiterating what Mike said, that the Growing Together plan is going to help us combat that a little bit more. Um, the other piece is, uh, you know, there's a hard choice for parents. We do have an early start time for elementary. We do have reasons for that early start time uh, that uh, we're not gonna go back on. And uh, for a lot of parents, there's a choice early in the morning about that bus ride or walking. But um, I think my main point tonight is just to congratulate the district again on being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. This is another example of us doing work that in my view in the past, we weren't balancing all these different streams of 
positive direction. And so thank you for bringing this. Welcome. And uh, that's it. Said Aris. Welcome. This is thank exciting. You. It is. <laughs> Um, you touched on so many different points that I was like, yes, yes, yes. And so I take opportunity now um, to, you know, just uh, bring it to um, how we needed you. Um, and when you mentioned about the projects, um, we have our operations department has done amazing work building new schools, you know, HVACs. I mean, you, you name it, uh, solar panels, we're, we're looking at playgrounds, outdoor learning spaces, like fitting them up. I mean, it's been a whole lot of work that has happened and is ongoing and energy assessments and everything else. And so sometimes like the little, little projects, like those little, little things, like who's tending to them and how, you know, how to, how to maximize. And, and so when you were mentioning about um, making that analysis and, you know, working with everybody who's doing the different work and figuring out like um, how to have a better analysis of the needs when it comes to pedestrian safety, those things are so important. Um, it's in it's in those small details, right? Um, one thing I've been asking for in many different, I think it's the third time or fourth time, I can't remember, keep track. But um, I'm very um, grateful that Durham has invested in having a trail behind Hillside, right? The ATC. But I'm I'm saddened that our Hillside students don't use it as much. We don't have bike racks at Hillside. I'm gonna say that like for the so many times I've said it. There's no bike racks. So if you wanted to say, you know, there's Solite Park. There's a dirt, a dirt uh, biking amenity that a Solite Park has, and there are clubs out there. Like there are groups, school groups that are doing dirt biking. You mentioned Bike Durham working with um, elementary school students of, that are in elder ages or older ages. Sorry, um, but it, it's a missed opportunity when you know we have these amenities nearby, like the ATC Trail. And we're not seeing our community. We're not seeing that connection. And I loved how you framed it, connections between schools and their communities. I want Hillside to enjoy as much, like our Hillside students to enjoy as much of like the amenities that are around um, to, to be able to bike to school and have bike racks. Um, we, not too long ago, approved a plan where um, some of our tennis courts were gonna be fitted to do uh, sports events. And I'm so grateful for that, Dr. Monk. And it's great. And, and some of the students are saying, you know, longer, they're, they're wanting to stay after school to engage in athletics and we wanna promote that, we wanna incentivize that. Um, yeah. But for those who have the ability to use the ATC, I can see I can see an opportunity there. So operations has been really busy and there's a whole lot going on and there are these small projects. And so um, I'm so grateful for your analysis. I'm so grateful for everything that you bring. Um, and then also your connections to um, these groups that are doing great work to kind of get our kids moving um, healthy, you know, um, enjoying outdoor time. And the last thing that I will say is uh, your sampling of students. I have, I just have a question. Like, I'm, I'm like, yes, this is, we need the student voices, right? So um, can you tell me a little bit more about your sample? Like, who are, who is your sample? Because the mode share data? Yes. It was, I mean, the goal was every student um, so that they would be captured once during the school day. Um, and that is not me personally. I mean, I've done that with another school district before where I'm the one with the forms going into the school and asking them to collect the form, and it's very labor intensive. So the fact that it was already up and running when I got here, the procedure to ask, you know, homeroom teachers or their surrogate to submit this data once a month, just how did you get to school? Google form, there we go. 10 people this, 20 people this, and it was ready. So the sample, I mean, it's everybody. That's wonderful. Some schools had better submit. We, It's very good representation. I think there's a, a little bit of room for improvement, but I'm really confident in the numbers that we have starting. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, something we've discovered is there are eight schools within a quarter mile of the American Tobacco Trail, which is a fun opportunity. And also want to thank Dr. Hardy and academic services and all the schools out there and the teachers. This is an additional thing. We realize it, but I think you're seeing tonight how that helps us plan and project and anticipate uh, what's happening. One of the things that Kristen shared is the differences in the afternoon and in the morning ride share, right? Well, those are some big numbers and some important things that help us plan and be, be ready to be efficient and safe and equitable all at the same time. On the, the trails point, um, I'm glad he mentioned that because it, sometimes it's not always about infrastructure gaps and sometimes it's about 
policies and communication and education. And there is um, something that's already there and available. And do we know about it? And is, do we make space for that to be an option? So, um, and there's other schools that are on um, greenways, not just the American Tobacco right. Trail, so. And if I may add, the city is expanding Avondale. You know, that, that project has been 10 years in the making and now they're doing the community engagement about it. So there's more trails coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we make sure that our communities are using them and feel safe using them? Um, and that we're catering to, you know, to incentivize um, the use of open spaces and, and, and these trails. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Byer. Well, welcome. I am so glad you are here and sharing your talents with Durham. It is much needed. I'm glad you're welcome in the spaces with the city and the county um, and the planners. Um, overdue. But um, I wondered, particularly as uh, fuel prices are going up, whether you thought of doing work over the summer kind of to encourage carpooling, to, inc to talk about the benefits of actually riding the bus to reluctant parents that hadn't thought of it before or thought it was not safe or like to, you know, yeah. are you all thinking of doing anything different to kind of message to families? Um, I'm really excited to be invited to the leadership retreat next week to speak directly with our administration or our school administrators. Um, and so I think communicating transportation options for the next school year um, is a big part of that. And I'm happy to work with principals one on one as many as I can. Um, I don't think we would have like that district wide toolkit, you know, ready yet, but I, I'm here to do one on one as, as much as they'll have me. Um, and I've already done some of that, you know, I mentioned Forest View, but there's other schools that I've been at to observe, sit down with the principal, talk about how things are going and come up with a plan for communicating options. I appreciate it. I think there's such opportunities for families that it's also childcare in the morning and the afternoon, a bus ride is a little bit like to cover some of these shifts in, in time. And, you know, I know those are separate issues that we're working vigorously on and we hear our community with those needs for um, before and after school. Um, so I just look forward to kind of ways that um, you can bring specifics back to mm -hmm. us that we can advocate for if sidewalks, like specific places. And if people have safety concerns specifically, are they supposed to reach out to you, Kristen, um, about safety issues at a specific school? Or do you think you've found them all already? Um, Not found them all already yeah. in progress, but they can reach out to me directly. Yep. That's fantastic. No, I, thanks for everything. It's, it's very exciting work. And I look forward to where you take us. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Thank you all so much for your presentation. Thank you. Then the next item on our agenda is growing together programs and school boundaries. I hand it to Dr. Mavinga. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mark and uh, the other team to come forward. I just wanna make a few comments here before we get started. To our board, as well as our community, our DPS community, this work has been going for the past three years. Uh, thank you to our board for allowing us to really embark in this particular initiative. Uh, I just want to brag a little bit about our staff, uh, the expertise of our staff. If uh, those of you that were not around here three years ago, we can all recall Mr. Matthew uh, Palmer was working for NC State as a consultant, expert, one of the best in the nation. So we're very privileged to be able to recruit him to join our team. And I will continue bragging that the work that has been done, it's like we're able to pay a lot of money to expert to be able to get this work where we are today. It's been almost 30 years. So whatever happened in the past, I think we are here to be able to correct it and be able to move forward. As I'm looking at this uh, vision of uh, region models, if I have to talk a little bit about the finance or the cost of this, I uh, thank you for our board for being able to be patient with us a little bit. I really wanted to let our finance team to be able to close out all the books for the month of uh, uh, June. Then July, we're going to start looking at how much this is going to cost uh, implementing this 24-25. But this is what I can say. 
when it comes to year round school uh, programs, it's not gonna cost us additional funding. The alive, the way we are envisioning this program, if it's going to be one classroom or two, I don't think it's gonna cost us million of dollars to implement this. Um, give us the benefit of doubt to be able to look at all the different programs that we have in the district. As we all know, we have about 23 magnet schools. We're gonna reduce this. Hopefully we're gonna have some saving as well. But we're bringing this to you. This work has taken a lot of hours. We've been with a push to be able to reach out to all stakeholders, you name it, Durham Comedy, People Alliance. We met with everybody. We even studied this community engagement with RTI as our consultant to be able to show us the path forward, how we could better engage our community. I'm here in front of you, feeling really confident with the work that we've done. I'm not saying this work is obsolete, that is done, we'll never touch this again. Other district, they look at this every year, every two years, every three years. Give us a chance to move forward as we have our timeline. Once we start implementing this, as you've seen with our work with our strategic plan, we come to you to tell you what is working well, what are the challenges, what are our next steps. Pretty much we'll be bringing this to you, all the concerns, all the challenges that we're gonna face in the community, we'll bring them to you to ask for your blessing for us to be able to make adjustment. But I'm feeling really confident with the work that has been done and the community engagement that we're able to undertake. And when it comes to finance, I'm feeling really confident I say this to our CFO, I don't see us really going to our county commissioners to ask for funding for this. With all the program analysis that we're gonna do to be able to leverage with all different programs that we have, we should be able to have enough funds to be able to address this. I think doing this work, what really triggered this work is we all know Durham is growing, DPS is not growing. All this menu of programs that we're bringing forth, this is what our family has been asking us. Allow us to be able to move forward. Hopefully with all this initiative, we'll be able to capture whatever 20,000 more school aged that are going to be in Durham in the next five years. We are very optimistic. We're gonna engage our community, but giving them the choices that they've been asking I'm hopeful that DPS will continue growing. Mr. Sadov. Good evening again, board members and colleagues. Thank you for uh, being great, a great team of partners working together on this with our community. If we could go to the slides, please. This evening, we bring forth school boundaries for final approval. And in addition to the boundaries, the administration will provide a brief review of the program application schools that are being recommended for the five regions and will share an overview of the process for developing rules and implementation. If we go to the next slide, please. You see our agenda tonight. I'll begin with some updates on community engagement in the month of June. We will revisit the why. We will bring forward our recommendations for school boundaries. We'll talk about our next steps, our important steps, public steps in rules and implementation adoption. We'll talk some more about the community the communication strategies that we have learned through this process that we will need to implement going forward. And we'll share a timeline and open things up for discussion. If we could go forward two slides, please. This June, we have taken advantage of the additional time that you asked for. Uh, we distributed uh, more about 20,000 flyers uh, for, to our schools, asking them to distribute them to their students, um, to our elementary schools. Uh, we held information sessions at Holton. We attended numerous uh, public festivals, uh, 
applying sunscreen, making sure that we did lose one, one tent in a big gust of wind there at Ju the Juneteenth celebration. Um, we have activated our parent ambassador group that is uh, going and growing. We have met with community ambassadors from, uh, ac from activists and interest groups across uh, Durham County. We've met specifically with specific groups. We've held kitchen table meetings in the Birch Avenue, Rockwood and Lakewood communities. We've met with local political action committees. We have taken further steps as, long, as well as our existing electronic steps to reach out to families and to move forward. We know we have more to do and I will come back to you at the end of this uh, presentation with some of those lessons learned. But with that, I will turn it over to Matthew Palmer for the why. Thank you, Chip. Um, if you would, next slide, please. Um, this is really important to reset all of us. This has been a three-year journey, but really a 30-year journey. And if you go further, as Mr. Jones talked about, it goes further back than that. Uh, we wanted to start with what we've heard, right? And how this proposal before you for a school system student assignment plan, a comprehensive plan reflects what we've heard because we've heard different things. Next slide, please. So in meeting with you, the board, in meeting with our parents, now over 50 events in accumulation, right? We've heard different ideas of what do we value? What do we want, right? We certainly want diversity. We hear we want our schools to look like Durham. We also want our schools to be close by for our neighborhoods, for our kids to maybe be able to walk a bike or some other mode, right? Or to attend that after school function. But we've heard we want to be able to choose the option. I know my child best and I want to be able to choose what's best for them. And we've also heard that we need to grow DPS. We have had campaigns say yes to DPS and otherwise, right? We, we are not serving every child in Durham County. We know that, but we can certainly serve more. So these values are shared amongst the board, amongst the community and amongst the administration. This design proposal reflects that. We're gonna go one by one and talk about how this proposal tethers back to some of these shared values, but also how some of these shared values are in tension at times with one another and there are trade-offs, right? Next slide, please. So we have certainly heard we want a school that is diverse like Durham is, right? And as a county, Durham is diverse. If you would, next slide, thank you. However, we have had and continue to have deep residential segregation. And so it's important to acknowledge that we have opportunities to improve the integration and diversity of our schools through tools like school boundaries. You would next slide. Thank you. So it's not just about school boundaries. It's also looking at when we run our lottery through student assignment, it's not just reflecting the applicant pool. What we're looking to design and bring forth is about waiting out that base area boundary with those that apply. So that overall, the school is looking more like Durham. But having said that, right, we also recognize those long ride times and we have an opportunity through the regional design that is making sure that all of those regions, all five of them, again, every region is $50,000 or more at a medium family income and 50% or greater for families of color. That's an important if we're gonna look at boundaries and the lottery. Next slide. Now the second idea, we want options to choose what's best for our child. We hear that a lot, right? If you would, a couple tabs, thank you. So number one, we have to make sure, and this is our cornerstone of this proposal, every school in Durham is a great school. And we have to bring the resources into those schools. We have heard extensively through our engagement, this conversation is about resources. And does my child have access to the resources that other children have? Thank you. In addition, that spatial inequity, right? Certain areas of Durham having options and other areas of Durham not having any options. This recalibrates that and makes sure no matter where you live, you're gonna have options and the likelihood of accessing those options is comparable. One more tab, please. Thank you. And when we look at those lottery seats, that relates back. I know we've had questions about the number of lottery seats in the regions. We're trying to make sure that again, no matter which region we're talking about, 
the chance of getting into a seat is comparable, that we're not prioritizing one area of Durham over the other. Next slide, please. And yes, we have heard that we want good schools close by, right? that we don't have to take a two hour bus ride to access a pre-K program or to access a choice program. Can we do more there? And the answer is, yeah, we can. So we have to be mindful though, that we have to balance that desire for being close by with the realities that we shared about choice and diversity. It's compelling to want a diverse choice neighborhood school. And in rare instances, we're able to pull that off, but rare being one out of 31, right? We've brought forth a design that is trying to encompass all of this. A couple tabs here, please. Thank you. One more. So the regions, number one, align with some of our major infrastructure like Interstate 85 and Interstate 885. Number two, we have 830 neighborhood planning units. Those are all drawn with neighborhood streets in mind. 35 miles an hour, you've heard from us, is an important speed. The reason is because that's the speed that a nine-year-old can't tell the distance or the speed of an oncoming car. So all of our neighborhood planning units are designed to make sure kids don't have to cross those busy roads to get on the bus and that we're not dividing neighborhoods. That's a tricky one because defining a neighborhood as we've learned together is hard, right? And the last piece, just with regards to for every school, we're not only looking at, you know, yes, we've talked about application schools, but it starts with our neighborhoods that every school has a base area associated with a base boundary. And then for a few schools, we have set aside lottery seats again, that we can use to balance out the overall demographics and provide choice. So wanted to start with this why to help set the table for what you're seeing before you. I know this is our second reading, but it, it seems important to reset where we're coming from with this and what we've heard over the years together. Next slide, please. Hand it over to Dr. Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, and good evening, board. This is a summary indeed of the values that we've heard from across our community through engagement internally and externally. And so on the next slide, we wanted to just give a brief recap of the programs that are selected to be our application programs and a little bit of a reminder as to the why, building upon the values that Mr. Palmer just laid out. When we selected year-round uh, year programming, it, a reminder that through the intercessions, there is great opportunity for intervention and enrichment. And of course, with some shorter summer breaks, there's less time to lose learning and build up a greater time to build upon and retain learning. As you all know, our year-round schools are highly requested across our community engagement, and we have high demand through our applications. And as a side benefit, year-round calendar schools offer an, an opportunity to offset operational demands. As far as dual language immersion, we know that research is showing us that students who participate over time in dual language programs who are uh, Spanish-speaking or non-English speaking perform equally to their English-speaking peers that have participated in dual language programs and outperform English speaking students in non DLI instruction. There's greater academic performance, greater cognitive development in these children, and of course, a rich opportunity and positive cross cultural uh, development attitudes and behaviors. We've heard a lot from our community to offer a dual language programming and through this proposal, indeed, we have expanded to five opportunities. For Montessori, our peer research, of course, shows that the Montessori pedagogy effectively accelerates academic, uh, pro, academic performance and social development. The holistic approach to Montessori education fosters independence and self-directed learning. This indeed, again, is a highly uh, regarded program. We've heard a lot through community engagement to increase those opportunities. And we have evidence of that through our lottery application historical um, data. And finally, the International Baccalaureate Program highly regarded through peer research, shows that critical think thinking skills develop a strong global awareness and of course collaboration skills. This by expanding an IB program at elementary will give us increased opportunities for participation in our K-12 continuum, uh, particularly for our secondary numbers. The global competitiveness, including world languages participation, again, is a reflection of the value of our community and ask for an increased access to languages. So next, I'm going to invite Mr. Palmer back to review and go over the school boundary highlights 
that we are proposing to launch in 24 or 25. Thank you, Dr. Pittman. And this is a good time to remind ourselves that the proposal before you, the recommendations before you, uh, are ultimately about school boundaries for the 24-25 academic year, which is over two years away. We we'll talk about all the work that we need to do between now and then, but I just want to, again, come back to the reset of why are we proposing and what are we proposing? Next slide, please. So we've seen this slide a few times. This is where we are today with DPS. 31 schools for the upcoming year, celebrating soon a ribbon cutting for Lions Farm Elementary School. That's gonna be a lot of fun to see you there. And yet we do have wide disparities currently today in the year 2022. We have schools next to each other that range from 26% free and reduced lunch to 100% free and reduced lunch. We have schools that are 100% students of color and those that are less than half, right? At the same time, the mileage it requires for us to get children from home to school under our current system of student assignment, those complex rules, those boundaries that you see here that reflect sometimes like Glenn, 20 miles long, that's 28,000 miles just from home to school one time. Twice a day, you're over 50,000 miles. Over the course of a school year, over 5 million. So we're gonna come back to that number because those numbers relate back to how long are the bus rides and how much does it cost to get to school for us as a district and an administration. Sometimes equity and efficiency can go together. They don't always have to contrast one another and those trade-offs can be a win-win. Next slide, please. That's one of the main points we wanna to make tonight is that it can be compelling for us to draw boundaries for a neighborhood or for a school or one student. Again, we're looking at a big picture lens of the entire community. Part of that, when we talk about growing together, is growing our mindset, right? That's much of what we're trying to do as a team. Next slide. To do boundaries, we need those three inputs. The academic program, which we've heard about previously and again tonight. Our facilities, where are they? How big are they? What are they designed to do for instruction? And our students, can they get to school? How far is that, right? What resources do they have access to? What resources are they bringing into the school? We need to be looking at all of that. So we put these three streams together to bring forth the boundary proposals. On the next slide, you'll see what we're proposing. So on the left is where we are today. And on the right is what we're proposing. This is with regards to the 24-25 academic year. You can see here all 32 schools, including the newly named Murray Massenburg Elementary School that's gonna relieve severe overcrowding at six schools directly around it. Next slide, please. I'm gonna take just a moment for each of the regions to review the Northern, Central, Eastern, Southeast, and Southwest regions. So you have a refresh. Next slide, please. One more. Go to Southeast. One more slide, there you go. In the Southwest region, one more slide, please. Thank you. For those watching at home or for those that might be reviewing this on, on a tape delay, um, we do have all of this information, an interactive boundary map where you can look at our existing boundaries as well as those that are being proposed, the regional lines, et cetera, on our Engage DPSNC webpage. That's a link there. And you can search down to your home address. You can look at where we've been and what we're proposing. Next slide, please. So one of the things that the board and the administration have set forth on is our strategic plan. And you've heard a lot about strategic plan priority goal 5C. Much of that is about elementary school classrooms. And do we have enough seat for kids, right? We as a district right now have over 100 mobile classrooms being used in some capacity. This proposal reduces 13 severely over or under enrolled schools down to three. And of those three, they're all in the capital improvement program that we need your support, the county support and our community support for. Those are Glen, Bethesda and Club Boulevard. This also helps us align the EC and pre-K programs. We've talked about that. Those pathways, do families have to jump from school to school or can we put forth a cohesive plan for every child? Many of our schools, have lost their art and music rooms because of overcrowding. This brings 
those rooms back to every school. And again, the opportunity, even with Murray Massenburg, to take out the mobile classrooms around it and have those children learn in classrooms designed for permanent elementary school, high quality instruction. A mobile classroom is a temporary arrangement. It is a temporary plan. It is not a long-term solution. This helps us move in that direction and achieve 5C. Next slide, please. Now, strategic plan priority goal 5E talked a lot about efficiency and it was specific about state metrics, but I'm gonna talk about our metrics. Remembering the 28,000 miles that is from home to school for our students. We can nearly chop that in half through looking at how far are the boundaries from home to school. And yes, the regions provide us an opportunity to ensure that you have an option, but you don't have to go two hours away to get it. Our earliest rider in Durham Public Schools is a pre-K student that we pick up at 5.02 in the morning. Not only does that help us with our efficiency, if you could go to the previous slide, please. Other direction. If the IT team could go in the other direction, please. Thank you. We're dealing with a bus driver shortage. We have half the drivers we used to have. We've talked about bell schedules. We know that's hard for families. We know this proposal is hard for some families too, but the part of being efficient is also making sure that we can work with the resources that we have, right? This proposal and the reduction of miles also redu reduces the number of bus drivers we need to run those routes, right? And shortens the ride time for those students. Next slide, please. Today, currently the majority of our application program or what we have historically called magnet program seats 72% of those seats sit in some version of a priority, either for a prioritized neighborhood or for a sibling linkage. And we recognize the deep value of linked siblings, families staying together. Right? It is board policy, even in the updated 4150 around sibling linkage. However, that leaves only 28% of current application seats available for other families. And most of those programs are in certain areas and not in others. With this proposal, that balances that out at 49% for that base area neighborhood school that all of our schools are now neighborhood schools and then reserves an additional 50% of the seats for lottery access. Next slide, please. Not only can we increase access, we can increase the distribution of that choice, making sure that areas in Durham that don't currently have representation in the application program do. There's areas of Durham where we're losing a massive amount of our students because we don't have an option for them. We have one single option for them. It is DPS or the alternatives. And many times they're choosing the alternatives. This recalibrates that distribution of choice across our five regions, making sure Northern, Eastern, Central, Southeast and South, Southwest are equivalent or comparable with regards to the location and accessibility of our application seats. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Director Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, and good evening or good night. I don't know, it's pretty late, everyone. Throughout the Growing Together initiative, our intentional goal has been to listen and reflect the voice and values of Durham. So tonight, as we move forward with the implementation phase, we will continue to ensure that we honor the voice of our internal and external stakeholders. With this, we are excited to develop the implementation advisory work group with the purpose of advising on rules of student assignment for implementation beginning the 24-25 school year, representing, I'm sorry, let's go to the next slide, please. There we are. So our group will advise on the rules of student assignment for implementation beginning the 24-25 school year and represent the beautiful diversity of our Durham community to consider how rules may impact the various students and families that we serve and to be as minimally di disruptive and as fair as possible. Next slide, please. So this slide outlines the overarching objectives that we look to accomplish with the advisory work group. 
Primarily, we will develop school assignment rules that will ensure a balanced lottery, address program links, attendance zones, regional access, and opt out processes. We will also develop rules regarding siblings, how we'll bridge legacy students currently attending schools or programs, and shaping transition processes for phased in and phased out programs. Next slide, please. So the advisory work group will begin by utilizing feedback that we've received from previous communicate, community engagement sessions and will draft proposed implementation rules. We will then share the proposed rules with the Growing Together community ambassadors who will be trained to cascade that information throughout their various communities and gather feedback. In conjunction, the district will hold meetings in each region to ensure that members of the community have the opportunity to provide feedback as well. From there, the advisory work group will analyze the collective feedback and finalize the rules to be shared with our community. And this process will extend through the fall of 2022. Next slide, please. So the comp composition of the advisory work group will be representative of members across Durham County to include parents, school and community leaders, principals, and experts in the area of education policy and planning. We look forward to working with our ambassadors, individual school communities, and district staff to gather feedback and thoughtfully communicate the implementation plan. And what better person to follow me, I will pass the next part of the presentation to Mr. Sutter to share more about our communication strategies. I think it is fair to say that this has been the most robust community engagement work that Durham Public Schools has done in many years, um, and that there is far more to do. Uh, both of these things are true. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So in the midst of these 50 meetings and these hundreds and or thousands of engagements and all of the input that we've received in person and digitally, We've also learned that we need to do more, particularly with school-based communication, empowering and supporting our schools with information and resources and training and expectations um, to make sure that the most vital link between Durham Public Schools and our families, our schools, is robustly involved in uh, the community engagement and outreach and our principals and our school staff are working extraordinarily hard. This is a hard ask for schools. It's a hard ask for districts. Um, I can tell you from going to lot weekend after weekend uh, meeting and uh, being out in the hot sun, but this is the work that we have to do collectively as a district. And it is our role as district leaders to support our schools in that effort. Existing parent networks are super important. Uh, Ms. Valladares has mentioned WhatsApp groups before, and we had really, really great feedback at the Holton uh, PLC meeting uh, about just how complex and how powerful those are. Our families who are the least engaged in our formal traditional community engagement are super connected in other ways. Many of them are informal, some of them created within school communities, but not part of the official school community. We have to identify those networks, work with our community engagement partners in Durham Public Schools, and um, take better use, make take better use of them. With the implementation rules working group, with their work, with the middle school and high school work going forward, we will continue our mix of digital and in-person engagement opportunities. Both present opportunities for greater equity. You can't have one without the other. We will continue to be present at community events. We're going to continue expanding our parent ambassador and community ambassador programs. And we are going to integrate this Growing Great Schools Together message into a comprehensive communication strategy that it builds from our strategic plan that my team is working on uh, over this summer. Um, 
we have lots of tools that we are currently using, ranging from Nextdoor and Instagram um, and existing social media to new opportunities. Radio is expensive, but we can go there. Um, regional representatives, we can go there. Um, we need to do more. We are planning for more. We And our community members who have come to us in community engagement opportunities have uh, shown us the way. And next we will go to the transition timeline. One more slide, please. Next year, new boundaries are in place for Lions Farm Parkwood and Creekside, and we launch this initiative for secondary programs. We begin working on the EC pre-K and regional alignment, and we work with the working group on finalizing student assignment rules. 2023 to 24, the new rules are in place for the lottery for the following year. We, we further uh, provide information about growing great schools together. 2024 to 25, that's when what we are asking you to vote on tonight goes into effect. Uh, at the same time, we open Murray Massenburg Elementary School and our regional access model programs, DLI and year round, and our global languages, STEM and arts in every elementary school launch. And then either it, the same year or the following year, um, we have completed renovated uh, renovations of our six elementary schools and the launch of our district-wide uh, choice programs or our application programs, excuse me, in International Baccalaureate and Montessori. So the action that we are requesting, if we could go to the next slide, is that we are presenting our recommendation for the approval of the boundaries. And we are happy to entertain your questions tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sutter and the team for all of the work that you all have done on this. Um, can't believe it's been three years. And I appreciate you grounding us in our why getting this process started, how we started, why we started, and, and what led us to making the presentation that is um, and the plan, creating the plan that we have today. Board members, are there questions, motions? Um, I want to start with profound gratitude for um, this work. It is complex. It is deep. It is, y'all have been at it for a long, 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 long time. Um, and it is like a tapestry. It is woven together, like, with so much data underneath it. Um, and you've been out there everywhere. I've seen you everywhere, you know, starting conversations. I think some some families are in it for understanding it for the last time, and some are still like trying to understand it because it is complex. I sent you lots of questions, and, and I'm sorry. I did not figure out until recently that one of my biggest concerns is East Durham. And it continues to be that sitting here tonight. And what I didn't figure out is that you've paired Montessori. I didn't figure out until I talked to Mr. Raven, actually. You've paired, in Eastern Durham, that region has a, a year round, a DLI, but the Montessori choice is Little River up in North Durham, which is not proximate at all. So that to me doesn't feel like a pairing that actually will will be fair to East Durham. And I'm not even sure yet still what the IB choice there is, even with all the questions I've asked you all and I, I'm so appreciative of answers. Is it Burton? Is it Poe as proposed? I'm still confused. Um, those don't feel proximate and that area of town, which I think needs TLC, doesn't feel like it's getting its fair share. And it's particularly when I compare it to the central region, and I shared a chart with you all, because I didn't figure it out till I put it in a chart. The central region, everything there is a choice school, except Y.E. Smith is a traditional neighborhood school. 
So there are four choices in that region, including EK Poe getting IB that I don't even know that they want or they asked for. But why East, East Durham just doesn't have the same equity and parity in my mind in this plan. And I know y'all have wrestled with that. I, I don't think I'm bringing you anything that you hadn't seen before. So I'm trying to find a way to feel that this plan is fair, knowing particularly the transit patterns. And Mr. Palmer, you put that in some of your answer. 98 is always bad. 70 is always bad. North Roxborough, Duke Street, always bad. Like. So how, how, and it, I feel like y'all are telling me this is the best we can do with the buildings we have, but I don't, I don't want that to be the best. And I don't want those choices not to feel fair and proximate and available in this plan. I, it's, it's not a question, it's a ramble, sorry. It's a, it's a very fair question. And I think I, we follow where you're going. Uh, something that I will, and Dr. Mbenga, if you permit me, I think you laid the groundwork early on. This is a start. The start as far as there are things in here that we're looking to bring on that are new and things that are new, different places, right? We've heard extensively from Northern Durham and Eastern Durham that, well, you have some Montessori programs, but they're really far away and we have a 0% chance of getting in, right? One in a thousand is what it breaks out into. What this proposal does do for Eastern Durham specifically is it ensures that there are protected application seats at a Montessori program eligible for Eastern Durham families. Propose that to be at Little River because of the three Montessori's that's the most proximate and there's space there to accommodate and support Eastern Durham and Northern Durham families both. That said, I'm gonna go back to the, to the chart of which schools in which regions. I think there's two conversations we have to have. One is about at which school is an application program. And as a family, which programs do I have access to? Those aren't really the same conversation. They can be compelling to put them together. That we have not located an IB or a Montessori program in Eastern Durham is in part because in doing so, remembering our five and 10 year forecasts the homes that are being built in Eastern Durham. If we were to put an IB or a Montessori program in Eastern Durham today, that would, as a result, be taking some of those seats that we need to support Eastern Durham families, which I would remind you at Spring Valley, we've lost the music room. We've lost rooms because of overcrowding. We have three open seats at Spring Valley in the whole school. So if we bring an application program to, let's say, Spring Valley, in doing so, we would, in effect, be bringing other areas of Durham to a school that doesn't have any room. We need the capacity very much in Eastern Durham, right? And I'll bring again, the application opportunities. What we're hearing from our families, I think principally number one, a resounding thing is we want quality schools, set the application part aside. We want our children to have access to art rooms, music rooms, a robust curriculum that's preparing for, for the 21st century economy. And yes, other families saying we want choice and of those, do I have a chance? Tell me what the rules are. Do I have a chance? Unfortunately, right now, our response is that chance is very low to very almost impossible, quite frankly, under the current structure. So the proposal that we have before you is looking at Eastern Durham and recognizing do Eastern Durham families have access to seats in the Montessori program or in the IB program? With this proposal, it would be at Little River and it would be at Burton. Putting a district-wide multi-region program in Eastern Durham with only five schools and two of them are already DLI in year run, you only have three left, would remove more seats from Eastern Durham families and bring us back into this conversation about the overcrowding in Eastern Durham. In five years, there will be some room, hopefully with the renovations at Glen and Bethesda, but at 10 years, we're gonna have the same problems with overcrowding. We have to prepare for that and not put ourselves or those families and children and staff uh, in an overcrowded situation. That's a very thorough answer. I hope that I'm sure you have other thoughts with that, but I wanted to paint that picture. No, that's, it's a good answer. It doesn't feel like an equitable answer. It feels like, because you know that I'm the one that said, don't we need to land bank in East Durham because there's so much growth out there. I, I am acutely aware 
of the growth in that part of town, but saying we'll build the capacity later and then you can travel a really long way. I mean, doesn't it doesn't have that balance and fairness that I want it to have with this plan. And it's it's what's bugging me about it. I kind of had assumed that because you have access to Montessori meant you went into this pool of people interested in Montessori. And then I figure out, oh no, we can't say of regional transportation if we don't designate pairing things up, right? And so y'all have paired stuff up, but I've never seen that in a slide, how it's paired when you don't have an IB or a Montessori in your region. And so that's what I'm still looking to make sense of, of my heart feeling like it's fair when you're bringing the data and I know the roads and the traffic don't make that an actual, it's, it's not, it's not proximate to where people are heading. Like it would be taking you, <laughs> feel like you're out of town in East Durham and to get to Little Riv, you're going backing up again. I, it just, that, that's the biggest gap. Did you all think about that overflow at WG Pearson as a potential solution for something along those lines? Y'all have wrestled with this longer than I have. Um, We've certainly wrestled with it, that I can attest to. Um, and we have looked at thousands of scenarios, quite literally, as far as permutations, right? We have 32 schools that we're talking about. We were also trying to be responsible with the Montessori and IB programs in part because there again, we have one IB program currently at Burton Elementary. It is a national model for international baccalaureate that supports Shepherd Middle School and Hillside High School. Right? Bringing on a companion IB elementary school, we looked at all of the opportunities, again, a district-wide IB. Right? One of the things I wanna point out about Eastern Durham is it is, as Ms. Byer, you pointed out, it is hard to get to, right? That is a reality of today. The East End Connector will help with that, but we're talking about old farm roads, right? That aren't on a grid, that are diagonal and long, right? If you were to bring a, a district-wide program there, now you would also be talking about bringing students from other regions all the way over to Far East Durham. We're trying to find a proximate Little River and Burton, both of which are adjacent to the Eastern region. So we certainly receive that. And I think something that Dr. Mabanga said again tonight is this is a start. We're trying not to grow those programs too big or too fast. Right. Mr. Raven. I'll start by saying um, I shared some of the sentiments with with, with Ms. Byer. We had a, we definitely had a conversation about this. I'll first start by saying thank you. Um, I'm extremely appreciative of, of what you all have been able to come up with. Looking at the just looking at what East Durham had right uh, when we're looking at the magnet application seat allocation. This was one of the things I, I spoke with Dr. Mubanga about. It's just I, I didn't realize it was zero percent. Like I knew it was, we didn't have any, but I didn't think it was literally 0%. And to see that go from zero to 20%, that, that's a huge change. And, and I, I think that, you know, with the growth in that area, with the number of subdivisions that are still popping up, it gives parents that are looking to send their kid to a, to a school, it gives them a lot of options and in, in, in consideration about where they're looking at as well. The other thing that I looked at, and I'm happy that you all are doing this, is when we're looking at the, the capacity of the schools within the Eastern region, it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting because most of those schools have a capacity of around 500 or some schools, but you all wisely dedicated Oak Grove as the year round school, I'm assuming, because its capacity is around 700. So that, that's because I, I looked at it and I realized that you all essentially made their, their mapping area a little bit smaller but it's because you all were compensating and accounting for all of the other ones. So I tried to find gaps with it. I really did. So, so any, any gaps that I have, I mean, it, it's, it's, I kind of have to separate my, my personal perspective on it because there are things that I, that I do want. But when you mentioned about that, that IB program and the capacity shortfalls that it creates and then understanding based on the CIP plan, all the, all the infrastructure improvements that will also come come about. I, I think that's something that I, I can live with because I know that you all are going to steadily be working on this. So I'll, I'll just say thank you again. 
Um, Ms. Lewis? Try to keep it really quick. Um, you know, there's a saying that, you know, that there's no, no stone that's, there's no stone that's been left unturned. And I just truly say that when I listen to again, the why and the different layers that you all considered, um, that is true with this proposal. I like that you said, this is the beginning. We've had several two by twos. We've had community engagement. We've had several questions being answered via email. And I see the time and diligence that you all spend with those questions, that individual attention. It, it, just, it just blows my mind how patient you are because it does take us some time for us to unpack this. And what comes naturally to you is a little more challenging for us when this isn't our area of expertise. But I, I just see Dr. Pittman as um, board member Raven shares the connections he's made to your wise as he's looking for gaps. And Dr. Pittman's looking on at Mr. Palmer, uh, Mr. Palmer like, yeah, that's exactly what he was thinking or what our team was doing. So I just, again, I commend your team and all the effort and work you've done to this. I thank you for this presentation. I am um, ready to move forward with it. There's just so much good stuff. I don't wanna take time to point out all the good that's in it. There's still more work to be done. And I look forward to getting to the rules because I think that's gonna be super important. So you'll, you'll hear more from me then. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Uh, Ms. Bagadar. I wanna thank you all so much. Um, there's definitely a lot of conversations, uh, a lot of discussions. Um, starting with you all as a team, thank you for all the ways, all the efforts. Um, I can speak to um, uh, Mr. Sutter when you were talking about the WhatsApp threads. You, you're popular. You know that uh, some of some of our community leaders that are out there promoting this, they changed their cover photo to feature you and some key key personnel from DPS. Believe me. I, I'll show you that picture when I get when you know just in a few minutes. You know, <laughs> um, you're you're pretty popular. So th there's definitely a lot that is going around. Um, you know, as you all are are going out into communities and especially ethnic um, uh, businesses. You know, like like local businesses, um, and you're out there in the community. Definitely, they 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 go there. They see you all. It's pretty visible. Um, I'm also so grateful for. The conversations. I know that this Tuesday, Dr. Pittman, I am sorry. I want to publicly apologize to you. And we, we, I definitely had a meeting. It was more than you, right? So, so another uh, district leader. But I just, I, I really know the level of commitment that you all have to listening, um, because that day was a Tuesday night, and you had back-to-back -back events, you know. And I borrowed, you know, right before you were supposed to go to the next event, just. Dr. Pittman, these are some concerns, or this is something that I care about, and it's about DLI, um, dual language uh, immersion. Dr. Pack, your work, you know, speaks. I, I, I got the whole history, you know, of, of 17 years uh, when it started with a seed for DLI, and how you know you've been instrumental in that process. You and so many others. Uh, I spoke to uh, Ms. Sashi Rayasam on Tuesday night, so I'm I'm just very grateful for that, and I think um, there's definitely. I hear Dr. Dr. Mubenga, thank you for that introduction when you talked about DLI and the commitment this district has to DLI. Um, it was very important to me to hear that, to hear that schools that have that program can continue to have that program and it is not to say that it's gonna be sunsetted. It was, it, it really caused my heart grief because I'm like, why would you sunset something? And, and I literally have like five pages. Dr. Pippen, you know, I was mentioning five pages, but, um, when it comes to greater intellectual cognitive flexibility and academic achievement over time, that's that's research from 2011, affirming diversity from 2000, native language. Uh, it talks about better communicative uh, capabilities, Petito in 2009, healthier self-esteem, cultural identity, strengthened pride and cultural heritage, enhanced employment opportunities in an increasingly global economy. Who wouldn't want that, right? And so um, to hear that we are committed to um, expanding the programs, Although not perfectly, I hear that we're starting, you know, in, with with attainable. But I just really want to hear, it, and I, I just want to hear it because this has kept me up at night. I want to hear it. We are committed to expanding these programs. We're not sunsetting any DLI program that currently exists. We are expanding it through a regional model. It's not touching these other programs. Can you can 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 do I have it right? Is that is that? 
Thank you, Dr. Mabenga. <laughs> I'm telling you because yes, I literally, I, I didn't want to have to grandstand. I was like, let me just print out every, all the ways like supporting, uh, you know, culture support, you know, just so much. There's so much that we can talk about in terms of DLI. Um, and I don't mean to go over it, but um, we did have an opportunity. I want to thank um, board member uh, Matt Sears and uh, board member Natalie Beyer and community leaders um, who took time as well to hear about programs that have worked and what does it take? I know it's not it's not just assigning a DLI program to a school and then magically everything's gonna fall into place. There's different factors. There's factors about, you know, the the, the leadership at the school. There's factors about having the the, the students there. So I, I, I hear you all in terms of what this uh, regional model growing together means. And it means a lot that also people that I that I look up to um, have also vetted it and looked at it. I just want to know that there's still room to continue that conversation about how to make it better. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful you have an, an advisory committee. And I just want to know, does the advisory committee have leverage to influence the implementation of this, of this process? I just wanted to hear a little more about what actual powers does the advisory committee have? Thank you. I'll start the, um, that answer and, and look to my team for additional, but really that advisory um, committee will, uh, will, will advise on the rules of how we will implement the, um, our, our Growing Together initiative. So this will be more uh, student assignment rules, how we will um, consider our regions, um, our, I'm sorry, how we'll consider our sibling preferences, how we how we will consider legacy students. So it'll be more about how we will assign students into the school. Uh, Mr. Sears. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Administration. Um, thank you. I, I often send you emails during the meeting or after thanking you uh, because you do this work every day and you you don't stop doing this work and. Um, it, our community has to know that day in, day out, this is what you all are working on and it's, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, Dr. Mabenga, thank you for discussing uh, what we know happens, but what the community needs to know. And that's that these other elements that we haven't discussed are getting worked on. Um, and the one for me that was important to hear is that um, you are looking at the budget implications. So thank you for your introduction tonight that shared that, um, well, folks can go back and look look up exactly what you said, but that you think we're gonna be in good financial standing around this um, and we have you know several years to get ready. So um, that that's that was the concern, the, the, the box that was checked. Um, I, I'll say what I've said to board members and community members over the last couple of weeks, and that's, I can find something to be unhappy about or that I think is a better idea um, and we all can do that <laughs> and something's not gonna work. We're, we're doing the best plan we can. So um, there's no point in us using individual um, lines or programs or things to, to hold things up. Um, I, I can be in support of the plan tonight. Mr. Lee. Uh, thank you. So let's see here. Uh, just, a, just a point of clarification. So the IB program that is a program within a school, right? So it's, it's a, like, for example, Shepherd, is everyone there in the IB program or is it uh, partial? Is there, you know, is that partial? The, the IB program infiltrates the whole school, okay. uh, much like the AVID, it's a philosophy of teaching. But uh, as you matriculate through the secondary schools, there's more specific courses that you would take and there's choice involved. So students who are seeking an IB diploma would take um, certain courses, advanced level courses in a variety of topics. I think it's four of six um, areas that they have to take a class in and then one in an advanced class to get that IB diploma. But it is a, a culture. Okay, so is, it, is the entire population lotteried in or, or, or is it zone? Is it? Currently at Hillside. Hillside, there's a there's a neighborhood, but then there's also lottery seats available. Right. What about Shepherd? 
lot is one hundred percent lottery. Shepard is one hundred percent lottery. And as is Burton. Okay. All right. And then secondly, um, just just a uh, just a question about the the sunsetting piece of the DLI. Is that a change? Does it did that change, or was it like a miscommunication from the beginning? It, it, I'm I'm just curious of what that was. I think it was a miscommunication. Um, my staff came to me today and said, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that was not a part of magnet schools. It was just a program that we're able to implement it, but there's as well as the Lakewood. So depending on funding, they should be able to continue if they feel like that's what they did for the schools. Okay, okay. I was just, I wanted to, I was curious because we got a lot of public comment. It was, you know, in here, just, you know, it was going to, the program was going to be Southwest. And I just wanted to make sure that people knew that it was a miscommunication and it was not a change. Um, yeah, there, there's a reason behind that, but I won't go, I won't necessarily go into that. Um, I support this. I think, um, of course, I thank everyone for working on it. I've, I've thanked them before, but I just, for those who are listening and have questions, I think no matter what, how you cut it, this increases the opportunities to go to neighborhood schools and opportunities to have um, programs closer to where you live. So your students aren't traveling far. It doesn't take you a long time to get there if there's a bloody nose or whatever, you know, you got to get to school quickly. Um, uh, reduces transportation. So I believe this is a very good thing for Durham. I cannot wait to support this um, as my last vote, I guess. <laughs> so, but uh, I really appreciate this work. I can't wait to see it uh, come to fruition in a couple of years. Um more gratitude and appreciation to the team for all the work that you've done. Um, it was about a month ago where we asked for more community engagement and I have seen you everywhere I have been and, and many other places in the month of June, right? That we really pushed through and had so many more conversations with families around what we're doing. I remember back to our board retreat where we talked about we wanted to simplify the fact that there were 30 rules for 30 different schools. And we wanted to create regional access to reduce transfer. Like we, as a board, made some of those requests and offerings. You took us through a great little dots activity where we had to put where we wanted, what we wanted to see as we moved forward. And so I just want to applaud you all for doing a lot of listening. I think the other thing I want to say is, you know, it is a tapestry. And if we start picking, we're going to unravel lots of different pieces because every one decision has an impact on something else. And so... I think you all told us in the past the best practice is to look at this every three to five years. Is that correct, Mr. Palmer? That's correct. Yeah, we're going to be, um, as we talked about tonight, we have staff that are looking at this every day and will continue to. We have to keep our eye on the ball year over year, right? When the enrollment numbers come in, we have to be looking at what choices our family is making. But in the big picture, this global conversation that we're having tonight, again, that comprehensive plan, those three pillars, we have to keep coming back to the academic program, our school facilities, and our students. And we have to look at all three together. Thank you. So I think this is a big step forward that hasn't been taken in the last 30 years and a step that we'll continue to revise and look at um, moving forward. And so I just wanna say thank you and I appreciate that. The other thing I want to warn us about, I think some of our questions are getting to the rules portion and the application portion, and we need to make sure that we allow for the time for the advisory group to get together for that to come. I think we can might be getting ahead of ourselves when we think about, well, what happens next? And so this is one step. The next step is considering what are all the rules and the implementation and the application and the legacy. That's the next step. So I don't want us to get too caught up in figuring out what happens next. We have to take this forward movement. Um, so I want to say thank you again. Or, I, could I get a couple more things clarified for folks that I don't think have been clear? And I'm not, don't believe I'm going in the rules portion or any of that. Um, can you all tell folks how you're envisioning W.G. Pearson, which sits as a year round in a nice spot that I know Mr. Palmer likes, but how will folks in the 
right? Eastern, Southwest and Southeast have access to two year rounds and not have more access to year round of choices than other folks. And right, you, I know you have an answer. I just don't get it. Okay, so we're gonna go through a, a fraction, a numerator and a denominator. Number of seats by program type that families in a region have access to and the number of students as the denominator in that region for Central, Southeast and Southwest, particularly because it's dense and Southeast and Southwest have more students than the other regions, right? Remembering the total number of lottery seats is dependent on how much of the boundary does the school also have to serve, right? So we look at this as an equation, number of application seats over total number of students in the region. We discovered through looking at this through our first iterations, remember, we've looked at this in a lot of different versions to make sure this core question, access, when we talk about it, do I as a family, as a parent applying to a program have the same chances as a family across the way, right? And what we discovered is in Southeast and Southwest, in particular, they were much lower because there's more students applying for a fixed number of seats. By bringing W.G. Pearson in, which sits at the intersection on Fayetteville Street, the Southeast Southwest, and as you'll remember, the historic W.G. Pearson building that is in the central region, by providing access to those three regions, W.G., we will ensure that families that live in those regions have an equivalent likelihood or chance of getting in, going to that fraction. How many seats and how many kids, right? What that means though, is that, I shouldn't say though, and what that means is, is that if families are applying or choose to apply in those three regions, they'll have two choices to apply to for year round, right? And we can go region by region again, but again, those three regions will have two options, their regional year round and WG in effect serves as an access benefit for the district, but especially for those three regions. So that if you're in Eastern, Northern, Central, Southeast or Southwest, the chance or likelihood that I get access to one of those year round seats is equivalent. So we saw it as a lean towards equity and also as an opportunity to honor that W.G. Pearson has a long and important history in Durham, right? This is honoring those families that do live in the old W.G. boundary, but it also is making sure that Southeast and Southwest have equivalent access to the year-round program. So unique opportunity um, to achieve a couple goals for the district around equity and access. And I appreciate all the talk of budgets and I also feel tension about not having detailed. Um, I think if we do projects like this in the future that are this wide sweeping, um, it's not just um, program shifting around, it's actually significant new allotments of foreign language teachers, over 20 in my, by my count at elementary schools that I've not heard how we're going to fund. Um, and so I, I have some unease about this. It's clear that that this is progressing forward, and I and I it's it's something that's so important to this community. I do not want to vote against it, and will not. But I but I need y'all to hear that, Dr. Mavinga. Um, we can't just we can't just do it on the on a post-it note and and a, trust me on a project this big in the future. This is this is huge. And then how do you all plan to communicate with these schools that are changing? So RN Harris, um, others in that you didn't I didn't hear that in the timeline of of how y'all I, I know they've heard of it, but what it, how are you gonna include them in a, in an active process of of listening to them? Certainly, there's been overview communication for at the awareness level, and now upon approval this evening, we will be able to push in with intense support and communication and working with schools. Every school in Durham is going, elementary is going to be impacted because they'll have new boundaries. Some have program implication coming up, going out. So we'll be working, in, envisioning really project teams for each school that will in, include communication and outreach. A motion. I move final approval and adoption of the Growing Together Plan 
as outlined at the May 19th Board of Education regular meeting for the designed academic application programs and elementary school boundaries. Second. The move by Ms. Lewis, seconded by Mr. Raven. Any other discussion? I do have one additional question. Why should we move on this net? Can y'all talk a little bit about timeline? There's been a question around, can this wait? We've heard from some community, can this wait to the fall or later to try to make these changes? Can y'all just speak to that really quickly? I apologize for Better two. Okay. Let's speak, please. Oh. <laughs> I did a district wide social distancing plan somewhere. Um, it's important for a variety of reasons on the timelines, mostly because the real work is ahead of us. We have to be thoughtful for every child, we have to be inclusive of our community. We have been intentional about not doing a top down. These families get to stay and these families get to go from the school. We have to have this conversation as a community, identifying task force members that are gonna be a part of that working group, making sure we have representation, not only of current DPS families, but future DPS families, not only of families from one area of Durham, but in all areas of Durham, our staff at schools, our principals, we need to make sure that our working group, we can bring folks in over the summer, begin that onboarding process, there's gonna be a lot of background work just to get them up to speed on the whys. It's taken us working with you, the board, a better part of three years. And we're gonna be putting them on the fast tracks. Right? Mr. Jones tonight shared the merger document from 94. That's a part of this conversation. Right? But we're gonna to have to bring those folks up to speed because again, Murray Massenburg opens in 24, 25, which sounds in our world years away. It's not, we've learned from Lions Farm, we've learned from Creekside and Parkwood adjustments that the longer we delay letting parents know, the more angst and anxiety that bubbles up, right? And it's important that we are able to advise the working group on where we've been and they can advise us on where we need to go together. Because there again, there's a second part of this conversation with regards to middle schools and high schools in the future for our secondary programs. This is a foundation of the house, but it is only a portion of the house. We have more work to do ahead. And we want the working group to come together, make sure they understand what they're advising on. That's the hard part is if you have an advisory group that doesn't know fully what the vision is, it's harder to design those implementation goals. So we have, I think in our timeline, you can see that January, 2024 is the golden, you know, that's when that lottery kicks in for the 24, 25 school year, but that's really not that far away. Right, that's about 18 months away. And there again, we have a lot of work to do to get up to that, to prepare ourselves and getting ready to go. Um, we have heard exhaust, well, I should not say, we have heard extensively from our families, let us know what's happening so we can make the decisions that we need to make for our family, right? Not six months in advance, not nine months in advance. This is ensuring that people have a sense of where we're going as a community. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. So moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. And it passes unanimously. Thank you all. Madam Chair, if I may, there are members of our team that are here this evening. If we could acknowledge, um, you have the faces who have shared the information, but if we could please ask our, our growing together members to please stand for their hard work and commitment over the many, many years. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much. And to the team, other members who are here today and those who probably are watching and streaming online, we know this has been a collective effort on, along with the other things you all are working on. So I just wanna say thank you again. Um, this is the first step. We know that there are many more and more steps to go. So I appreciate that. All right. That concludes the um, open session part of our agenda. I'll take a motion to go into closed session. I move we go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. Second. It's been moved and properly second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously.
I get a text, I can see the alarm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're sitting down. Yeah. yeah. How things? We are back in open session, Dr. Mabinga. Madam Chair, I'm here to seek for your approval for the personnel report as discussed at the closed session. I move that we approve the personnel to, the personnel report as discussed in a closed session for June 23rd. I'll second. It's been moved and properly second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously. Make a motion. I'll make a motion to recess this meeting until 5.30 on Wednesday. For personnel. Second. It's been moved and properly second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. We are now recessed. <laughs>